My name is Edward Feigenbaum. I am a professor at Stanford University in the Computer Science Department, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to interview my colleague and friend from 1968 on, uh, Professor Don Knuth of the Computer Science Department. Uh, Don and I have discussed the question of what viewers and readers of this oral history we think uh, there are, and we're orienting our questions and comments to several groups of you readers and viewers. First, the generally intelligent and enlightened science-oriented person who has seen the field of computer science explode in the past half century and would like to find out what is important, even beautiful, and what some of the field's problems have been. Second, the student of today who would like orientation and motivation toward computer science as a field of scholarly work and application, uh, much as Don and I had to do in the 1950s. And third, those of you who maybe are not yet born, the history of science scholar of a dozen or a hundred years from now, who will want to know more about Donald Knuth, the scientist and programming artist who produced a memorable body of work in the decades just before and after the turn of the millennium. Don and I share several things in our past in common, actually many things. Uh, we both went to uh, institutes of technology, I to Carnegie Institute of Technology, now Carnegie Mellon University, and Don to Case Institute of Technology, now Case Western Reserve. We both encountered early computers during that college experience. We both went on to take a first job at a university and then our next job was at Stanford University in the new computer science department where we've both stayed uh, from the earliest days of the department. So I'd like to ask uh, Don to describe his first encounter with a computer. What led him into the world of computing? In, in my case, it was an IBM 701 learned from the manual. And in Don's case, it was a, an IBM uh, Type 650 that had, that had been delivered to uh, Case Institute of Technology. In fact, uh, Don even dedicated one of his major books to the uh, IBM Type 650 computer. So Don, what is the story of your discovery of computing and your early work with this intriguing new artifact? Yeah, okay, thanks, Ed. For, uh, I guess I wanna add uh, that, that Ed and I uh, are, are, are doing a team thing here so that next week I'll be, uh, I'll be asking Ed the questions that he's asking me today. And uh, we thought that uh, it might be more fun for both of us and also for people who are, are listening or watching or reading this material uh, uh, to see this symmetrical approach instead of having a historian uh, in interviewing us. We, we're, we we're colleagues, although we work in different fields. Um, uh, we we, we uh, can give you some slants on the, uh, on the thing from people who've who sort of both have been there. And we're going to be covering uh, 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 you know, many years of, of, of uh, the story today, so we can't uh, uh, do too much in, in depth, but we, but we also want to, uh, 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 to do, do a few things in depth because uh, that's, the, that's the, the defining thing about computer science is that computer science plunges into things at low levels as well as uh, uh, sticking on a high level. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, uh, but since we're going to cover so many topics, uh, I'm sure that uh, I won't sleep tonight because I'll, th I'll be saying to myself, oh, I should have said su such and such when he asked me that question. 
Um, and so I think Ed and I also want, uh, are going to uh, 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 maybe um, add, add another little thing to this oral interview where we might uh, want to add a page or two of, think of afterthoughts uh, that, that come to us later. Um, be, uh, because then, we, then I don't have to be so careful about answering every question that he asks me now. And the interesting thing will be, you know, not only the uh, the wrong uh, the uh, the, um, the wrong answer that I, that pops in first in my mind, uh, but also uh, uh, maybe um, a slightly a slightly correction thing. But one of the stories of my life, as you'll probably find out, is uh, is I try to I, I try to get things correct. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I probably ob obsess about not making too many mistakes. Okay, now your question, Ed, was how did I get into this, uh, in, in, into the computing business? And of course, uh, 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 I was, uh, uh, when, when, when the uh, computers were first built in the 40s, I was 10 years old, so I certainly was not a, a pioneer in that, in that sense. Uh, um, I, I saw my first computer in 1957, uh, which is pretty late in the, in the history game as far as computers are, are concerned. On the other hand, programming was still pretty much an, uh, a, a, a new thing. There weren't that, I don't know, maybe 2,000 programmers in the world at that time. I, I'm not sure how to, how to figure it, but it was still fairly early from that point of view. But I was, uh, I was a freshman in, uh, in college. and. Um, uh, and so your your question was, how did I get to be a physics student there in, in college? Um, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I, I, I guess I might as well, you know, those of you who um, don't want to do, do the math could figure out I was born in 1938. Um, I, my father was the first person in his, uh, among all his ancestors, who had uh, gone to college. Um, my mother uh, was the first person in all of her ancestors who had gotten, who had uh, uh, gone to a year of of, of uh, school to learn how to be a typist. Uh, there was no tradition in our family of of uh, higher education at all. Uh, I think typical of America at the time. Um, my, you know, my grandfather, uh, my great grandfather was a blacksmith. My grandfather was a, a janitor, let's say, um, and uh, the the people were um, pretty smart. They could play cards well, but they didn't have an academic uh, background. Uh, my, my. Uh, uh, there's, I don't want to dwell on this too much because there's, I, I find that there's lots of discussion on the internet about the, about the early part of my life uh, uh, because I gave an interview, there's a book called Mathematical People in which, uh, in which uh, people ask me these questions at, at length as how, you know, how I got, uh, how I got started. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the thing that, that the one thing that stands out most probably is that is the, the uh, when I was an eighth grader um, there was a contest in the run by a local TV station uh, a company called Ziegler's Giant Bar and they said uh, uh, how many words can you make out of the letters in Ziegler's Giant Bar uh, and uh, well there's a lot of letters there and and I I, I uh, uh, I was kind of intrigued by this by this question, so I I I and I, and I had just seen an unabridged dictionary, and so what, um, so I spent two weeks going through the unabridged dictionary, finding every word in that dictionary that could be made out of the letters of Ziegler's Giant Bar, and uh, I uh, pretended that I had a stomach ache, so I stayed home from school those two weeks, and I and uh, the bottom line is that I found 4,500 words. Uh, that could be made, and the, the judges had only found 2,500, and so I won the contest, and I won I won Ziegler's Giant Bars for everybody in my class, and also uh, got to be on television and everything. So this was my this was the first indication that I would obsess about uh, about problems that would uh, uh, that would take a while to uh, that, that that would uh, you know take a little bit of uh, what do you call it long attention span to uh, to solve. Then. 
then, um, uh, but my main interest in those days was music, and um, and I almost went to almost became a music major when I when I went to college. Um, uh, the uh, our, our high school was was not very strong in science, so, but I had a wonderful uh, chemistry and physics teacher uh, who who uh, was co who who inspired me, and um, uh, I guess that and the, and but when I when I got the chance to go to Case, uh, the looking back, it seems that the the thing that I really that really turned it was that uh, that case was a challenge. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, it was supposed to have a lot of meat and a lot of uh, it wasn't going to be easy. While the, at the college where I had been admitted to to be a music major, uh, the people when I visited there they sort of emphasized how easy it was going to be uh, for, uh, there. And so I, instead of coasting, I, I I think I I was intrigued by the idea that. Uh, that case was going to uh, was going to make me work um, hard, and I was scared that I was going to flunk out. But still, I was ready to work, and and uh, so so I uh, I I I, um, I worked especially hard as a freshman, and then I coasted pretty much after after that. But it, uh, I, um, in my freshman year, I started out, and I found out that my that that my uh, uh, my chemistry teacher knew a lot of chemistry, but he didn't know physics or mathematics. My physics teacher knew physics and and uh, chemistry, but he didn't know much about mathematics. But my math teacher knew all three <laughs> things. I was very impressed by my math teacher. Um, then in my sophomore year in physics, I had to take a required class uh, of welding. Um, and I just couldn't do welding, uh, I, I, so I decided maybe I can't be a physicist. Uh, I mean, welding was was so scary. I've got these I've got these uh, thousands of volts uh, in this in in this stuff that I'm carrying, and uh, I, I have to wear goggles. I can't have my glasses on. I can't see what I'm doing, and the, and I'm too tall. The table is way down there. I'm supposed to be. Uh, having these scary electrons shooting all over the place and still uh, uh, connect X to Y, it was it was uh, it, it was terrible. So um, I had a miserable failure at welding. And uh, uh, on the other hand, mathematics uh, uh, in the sophomore year for mathema mathematicians, they they give you um, courses that are. Uh, what we now call discrete mathematics, uh, where you study logic and uh, th things that are uh, integers instead of instead of continuous quantities, and 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 uh, I I was drawn to that. That was something somehow I that that had great appeal to me. Um, meanwhile, I had also uh, uh, been in order to support myself. I had to work for the statisticians at Case, and uh, and first uh, this meant uh, drawing graphs. Um, uh, and sorting cards, and uh, so we had a fascinating machine uh, where you put in the punch cards, and 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 they and they fall into different piles, and and you can look at what comes out, and and then I could uh, plot the numbers on a graph and get some you know get get some uh, uh, some salary from this, and uh, uh, later on in the in my freshman year uh, there arrived a machine. That at first I could only see through the glass window, and they called it a uh, uh, computer, uh, and I, I think it was actually called the IBM 650 Univac. Actually, <laughs> it was a funny name because Univac was a competing brand. Um, and um, one night, a guy showed me uh, how it worked, and uh, and and gave me a chance to look at the manual, and uh, it was love at first sight. I. <laughs> I, f I could sit all night with that machine and play with it, and uh, uh, the and uh, so I I wrote my first programs for that machine in um, I think it was the uh, oh, well let me see uh, actually to be exact 
the first programs I, I wrote for the machine were not in machine language, but in a in a system called the Bell Interpretive System, um, which which uh, was like uh, it was it was all it was something like this. You have an instruction, it would and uh, and the instruction would say um, add uh, add the number in in cell two to the number in cell 15 and put the result in cell 30. And we had instructions like that. A uh, bunch of them. Uh, and and uh, this would, and, uh, and this uh, 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 w was a simple way to learn programming. In fact, I, I, I still believe that uh, it's, it might be the best way to teach people programming instead of teaching them uh, uh, what we call a high-level language now, uh, right now. Certainly, it's, a, it's something that uh, I could, you can easily teach to a fourth or fifth grader uh, who hasn't had algebra yet uh, and get the idea of what a machine is. I was pledging a fraternity, and uh, one of my fraternity brothers did, um, didn't want to do his homework assignment where he was supposed to uh, find the roots of a fifth degree equation. And so I looked at some textbooks and it told me how to solve a fifth degree equation. I programmed it in this Bell interpretive language. And I, I wrote the program. And uh, uh, my memory uh, is that it worked correctly the first time. I don't know if I really gave the right answers, but uh, but uh, uh, miraculously, uh, it ground out uh, these numbers, and uh, and my fraternity brother passed his course, and I got into the fraternity, and uh, and and that was my first uh, little, little program. Then I wrote, then I learned about the machine language inside the inside the 650, and uh, and I and I wrote my first uh, uh, program for the 650 probably in the in the spring of my freshman year. Uh, and debugged it at night, and, and uh, I believe that when I first wrote the pr the first time I wrote the program, it was about it was about um, 60, in 60 instructions long in machine language. It was uh, program to find the prime factors of a number. You, you, you 650 was a machine that had decimal arithmetic uh, work with 10-digit numbers and. And uh, you could dial the numbers on the console of the machine. So, so you would dial a, a ten-digit number, and my program would uh, go into action, and it would punch out cards that would say what are the what are the factors of this of this uh, number that that you dialed in there. Uh, computer was a very slow computer. Uh, it, it in order to do a division instruction, it took five milliseconds. Um, uh, right now, uh, I, th I don't know, is that six orders of magnitude slower, <laughs> slower than, than today's machines uh, to do division? Um, and of course, uh, the way I did factoring was, was by division. I had to see if a number was divisible by 13, I had to divide by 13, and then I had to divide by 7, well, I, I, I divided by 15 as well, 17, 19. And uh, it would it would try to it would it would try to uh, find everything that divided. And if I started out with a with the with a big ten digit number that happened to be prime, have no divisors at all, I think it would take 15 or 20 minutes uh, to, uh, be, for my program to uh, to to decide. Um, I, and not only did my program have about 60 or so, so instructions when I started, they were almost all wrong. And when I finished. Uh, it was about 120, 130 instructions. So I had I had made more errors in this in this program than there were lines of code. Uh, uh, one of the things that I uh, that I had to change, for example, that took a, that took a lot of work was I I had originally thought I could get all the prime factors um, onto one card, but you could only but a card had 80 columns and you could get 10 digits. Uh, uh, I mean, each number took 10 digits, so I could only get eight factors on a, on a single card. Well, uh, uh, you take a number like two to the 32nd power, that's gonna take four cards because there's two times two times two times two. Uh, it's gonna, it ha uh, so I had to put in lots of extra stuff in my program that would handle these cases uh, besides making that. So, I, so, I, so my first program was very, uh, um, uh, it, it, it taught me a lot about the, 
uh, about the errors that I was going to be uh, making in the future and uh, also about how to find errors. And uh, that's sort of the, the story of my life is uh, making errors and trying to recover from them. Um, Did I answer your question yet, or should I? No, <laughs> no, uh, I didn't think so. so. Uh, yeah. d Don, um, a couple questions about uh, your early uh, uh, career before Case and at Case. You mentioned the. Uh, it's very interesting that you mentioned the Ziegler's Giant Bar, because it points to a really early interest in combinatorics, and. Uh, your intuition at combinatorics is one of the things that impresses so many of us. Uh, why combinatorics, and how did you get to that? And what, what do you, do you see combinatorics in your head in a different way than the rest of us do? Well, I think that there is something wrong with my head. Something strange about my head. Uh, uh, it's, it's clear that I that I uh, I I uh, am, have much better intuition about. Uh, uh, discrete things and continuous things. I, 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 in, in physics, uh, for example, uh, uh, I could pass the exams. And I could do the problems in, in quantum mechanics, that, but I couldn't intuit wh what I was doing. Um, it was, it was, it, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel right uh, being able to get an A on an exam, but with it, without ever having the idea of how I would have thought of the questions that the the person. Uh, made up uh, solving the exam, but but on the other hand, in in my discrete math class, uh, uh, these were these were things that really seemed uh, you know part of me. So there's there's definitely uh, something in my in, in you know how I had developed by the time I was a teenager that that made me uh, uh, understand uh, uh, discrete objects, you know, uh, things that are. Like zeros and ones, of course, or, or things that are made out of uh, alphabetic letter, letters, uh, uh, much better than things that like Fourier transforms or or uh, or waves, uh, radio wave and things like this. It's a, it's a something you know. I I can do these other things, uh, but it's like a dog standing on a on his hind legs. Uh, uh, you know, he oh look, the dog can walk. You know, but no, he's not walking. <laughs> He's just the dog trying to walk, um, and uh, that's the way it is for me. And uh, and a lot of the a lot of the continuous uh, uh, or, or more geometrical things. But when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, marks on paper uh, or or uh, uh, integer numbers, like you know, finding the prime factors of of, of something, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a question that uh, that. Uh, 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 appealed to me more than finding even finding the the roots of a polynomial. Um, now, what, how did this? I, so, Don, I, yeah. question about about that. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry to interject this yeah, question, no, uh, be behaving like a cognitive psychologist, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, this is what uh, you're pa paid to do, right? Right. <laughs> uh, Herb Simon, uh, Professor Simon of Carnegie Mellon University, once did a set of experiments that kind of separated thinkers into what he called visualizers and symbolizers. Mm -hmm. When you do your, the combinatorics mm -hmm. and discrete math, math that you do, which, which so amazes uh, uh, us guys who can't do it that well, mm -hmm. uh, are you actually visualizing what's going on, or is it just pure symbol manipulation? Well, you know, I'm visualizing the symbols. Uh, I mean, to me, the symbols are reality. Uh, uh, it, in, in a way, I mean, I, I take a mathematical problem, I translate it to formulas. And then the formulas are the reality, and I and I know how to transform one formula into another, and that's, in fact, th that's the sub that should be the subtitle of my book, Concrete Mathematics, is how to manipulate formulas. Um, uh, I, I'd like to talk about that a little because it doesn't, you know, it's a, uh, it it started out uh, my cousin Earl who died uh, with. Uh, Earl Goldenschwager, he, he, he was an engineer, eventually went to Southern California, but I, but I knew him in, uh, in, in uh, Cleveland area. And when I was in second grade, he was, uh, I think he was, uh, had gone to, he, he went to Case. And he, he was one of the people who sort of influenced me that, that maybe good, good to go to Case. And, and uh, he told me 
when I was visiting him in the summer, he told me a little bit about algebra. You know, he said if you if if you have two numbers and and you know that 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 the sum of these numbers is a hundred and the difference of these numbers is twenty, what are the what are the two numbers? And and he said, you know how you can solve this, Don? Uh, you can say x is one of the numbers and y is one of the numbers. You know, x plus y is a hundred and x minus y is 20. And how do you find those numbers? He says, well, you add these two equations together and you get 2x equals 120. And you subtract the equations from each other and you get um, 2y equals um, uh, 80. You know, like, oh, so x must be 100 and y must be 40. I mean, x must be 60 and y must be 40. OK, uh, wow. And I, you know, this was an aha thing for me when I was in second grade. Um, and so I start, so I, so I, I, I liked um, uh, symbols in this form. Uh, the main thing that I did, uh, that I enjoyed doing uh, in seventh grade, was diagramming sentences. Um, and I, and I, uh, you know, and NPR had a special had a. Uh, there was a, a, a woman. Uh, uh, published a book about diagramming sentences, uh, uh, the lost art of diagramming sentences uh, d during the last year. And but this is where you take a sentence of English and you and and you uh, and you find its structure. Uh, and it says, you know, that it's it, it's a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. And a noun phrase. Uh, so let's take a sentence here. Um, uh, you know, uh, how did you get to be a physics student? Okay. <laughs> So okay, so here, here uh, it, it's not a noun phrase followed by it is an imperative, uh, you know, an imperative sentence. So it starts with a with an imper with, a, with a verb, um, you know, and, and how did you get? It's very very interesting the structure of that sentence, um, and and uh, uh, we had a textbook that showed how to diagram simple in English sentences, and and the kids in our in our class we would then try to apply this to sentences that weren't in the book, you know, sentences that we would see on, uh, in, in, in newspapers or on, in, in advertisements or so on. And especially, and we, you know, we, we looked at the hymns in the hymnal, and we couldn't figure out how to diagram those, and we spent hours and hours trying to figure this out. But we, but we uh, thought about um, structure of language uh, and, and, and trying to make these, these discrete tree, tree structures out of, out of English sentences. And that in seventh grade, and uh, and a lot of my friends and I, we, you know, we this uh, this turned us on. And when we got to high school, uh, we breezed through all our English classes because we knew more than the, English, the teachers did. That they had never studied this diagramming. So, so I had this kind of uh, interest in symbols and 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 diagramming uh, early on. Um, uh, I mean, it's, you know, discrete things early on. And so when it when it, when I got into uh, logic. Uh, uh, as a sophomore, um, uh, and, and saw that mathematics involved a lot of symbol manipulation, then uh, uh, that, that that took me there. And 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 then I get you know I see punched cards and has, you know, I mean the holes in cards are nice and discreet, and uh, the uh, uh, the way a computer works is 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 totally discreet. A computer has to stand on its hind legs doing trying to do continuous mathematics. Um, now, uh, I have a, 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 a feeling that a, a lot of the brightest students um, don't go into mathematics because they, um, uh, a, a, a curious thing that, that they, um, they don't need algebra at the level I did. I don't think I was you know, smarter than the other people in, in my class, but I, but I learned algebra first. And so, so the, 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 uh, a lot of very bright students today um, uh, don't see an, any need for algebra because they can psych, they, they, they see a problem, and I mean say, oh, the sum of two numbers is 100 and the difference is, is 20. They just sort of say, oh, 60 and 40. Um, th they're so smart, they don't need algebra. Um, and, and, and so they go on uh, uh, seeing lots of problems and they can just do them. Um, without knowing how they do it, 
particularly. And then finally they get to a harder problem where the, where, where the only way to solve it is with, is with algebra. But by that time, uh, uh, they haven't learned the, the fundamental ideas of algebra. And so the fact that they were so smart prevented them from learning this important crutch that was, that, you know, that, that I think uh, 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 turned out to be important for, for the way I uh, uh, approach problem. And, and so, so then they say, oh, I can't do math. <laughs> and then, and they, they do very well as biologists and doctors and whatever, and lawyers. <coughs> Uh, mm. Don, when mm. you, you're recounting your interest in uh, the structure of languages very early, seventh mm -hmm. grade, I think you yep. said, mm -hmm. uh, that's really interesting because among the people, well, the word computer science wasn't used, but mm. we would now call it information technology people, uh, your early reputation was in programming languages and compilers. Uh, were there, was the seeds yeah. of that uh, planted at Case? And, uh, and tell us about that early work. Right. I mean, that's how I got to know you first. Right. The seeds. Yeah. So the seeds were were planted at Case in 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 in, a, in the following way. Um, uh, I I told you that I uh, okay. So the first I learned about the 650, and then uh, uh, I'm not sure when it, when it was, but it probably was uh, in the in the summer of. Uh, of my freshman year, uh, where we got a program from Carnegie, where you were a student, that was written by Alan Perlis and, and three other people. IT. The IT program, IT. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, in standing for Internal Translator. Yeah, it was uh, Perlis, and, Van Zoren, and, and uh, Joe Smith. Yes. And uh, this and this program, uh, you would you would punch on cards a algebraic formula. You would say A equals B, B plus C. Well, you couldn't, in, in it you had to say X1 equals X2 plus X4, but you, uh, uh, you, you know, because you didn't have a plus sign, you had to say A for the plus sign. So you have to say X1, Z, X2, A, X4, and that would mean uh, no, or S, I guess, was plus, and A was for absolute value. But anyway, we had to encode algebra in terms of uh, uh, small character sets of a few a few letters and uh, uh, the uh, there weren't that many characters you could punch on a card uh, but they anyway you 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 punch this uh, thing on a card and and uh, you, you feed the card into the machine uh, the lights spin around uh, for a, uh, a few seconds and then punch 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 out come uh, uh, machine language instructions that set x1 equal to x2 plus x4. Uh, you know, automatic uh, programming uh, co coming out of, of uh, an algebraic formula. Well, this blew my mind. Uh, I, couldn't, I, I, I couldn't understand how this was possible uh, uh, you know, you know, to, to, to do this, this miracle where I had just these punches on, on, on the card and then to, then to I mean, I, I, I could understand how to write a program that would factor numbers, but I couldn't understand how to write a program that would, that would convert algebra into machine in, instructions. So and it hadn't yet occurred to you that the computer was a general symbol manipulating device? I, no, I, no, that occurred to Lady Lovelace, but it didn't occur to me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm slow to, ke to pick up on these things, but, I, but, but then I, I persevere. So. I got a hold of the source code for, for IT, which, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, uh, it, it couldn't be too long because the 650 had only 2,000 uh, you know, words of memory, and, and some of those words of memory had to be used for, to, to hold the data, uh, in, as well as the instructions. So it was probably, I don't know, 1,000 lines of code. But, but the, the source code is, is uh, is not hard to find. Uh, it's, it, they they published it in a in, in a report and uh, and I, I I'm, I'm I, I've seen it in, in 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 several libraries. I'm pretty sure it's on the internet uh, long ago, and uh, and I I, uh, I I went through every line of that of that uh, program and uh, uh, on our during the summer we. We have a family uh, get get together on a on a beach in uh, on Lake Erie, uh, and I would spend the time. I mean, we, you know, uh, playing cards and and playing tennis. But most of the time, I was 
going through this listing, trying to find out the miracle of how the IT worked. And, uh, and, and so, okay, it wasn't, that, it, wasn't that, it wasn't impossible after all. And, and in fact, uh, uh, I thought of better ways to do it <laughs> than, than, than we're in that program. Um, uh, since we're in a history museum, we should also mention that uh, the program had originally been developed when Perlis was at, at Purdue uh, before he went to Carnegie, uh, with, uh, with 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 three other people there, uh, I think uh, I think uh, maybe Smith and Van Soren came with Alan to to Carnegie, yes, but there was right. a Sylvia Orgel and several other people at Purdue who who had worked on a on a similar project for a, for a different computer uh, uh, at Purdue, and then and then that project uh, Purdue got to get you know Purdue also produced another compiler. Uh, 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 a, a different one. Uh, it's, not, it's not as well known as the IT, but but, uh, but anyway, uh, I didn't know this at the time either. Uh, still, the, uh, the the code w uh, was w was you know once I saw how it how it happened, uh, uh, this was inspiring to me because uh, also uh, the discipline of reading other people's program was was something good to learn early. Uh, you know, and uh, and and I uh, uh, through my life I've had a, a love of reading, uh, reading source materials, reading somebody's uh, uh, something that 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 pioneers have written, uh, and and trying to understand this, uh, what what their thought processes were in order to write this out because I, I find that this, especially when 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 they're solving a problem I don't know how to solve because this is the best way. To, for me to put into my own brain how to how to get, get past stumbling blocks, so so to, you know at, at case I also remember looking at uh, at papers that Fermat had written in Latin in uh, in the 17th century uh, in order to understand the, how that great number theorist uh, approached problems, and all, you know so I I I I, I I, I continue. I I, I uh, have to rely on on friends to help me get, get through Sanskrit manuscripts and things now. No, but I still. Uh, you know, I mean, last uh, uh, just last month, I, I I found to my great surprise that the that a concept of uh, that I found to my great surprise that that a, that the concept of orthogonal Latin squares, which we probably talk about briefly later on, um, uh, uh, originated in uh, North Africa in the 13th century, uh, or was it 14th century? Anyway, it was. Uh, I I was uh, looking at some uh, some uh, uh, historical documents and and I, and I came across this this old. Uh, Arabic, uh, you know, accounts of this Arabic uh, thing, and and then by reading, uh, by reading it in in French translation, I was I, I, I was able to, to see that the guy really had this concept of orthogonal Latin squares that early, uh, which uh, the previous earliest known example was uh, 1724. So 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 uh, uh, I, I I love to look at um, the work of of pioneers. Uh, and and st and see what they're uh, and try to try to get into in, in, into their minds and see and see what's happening. Yeah. One of the th uh, things worth observing, uh, it's off the track, but uh, as long as we're talking about history, is that um, our current generations generation and generations of students don't even know the history of their own field, and they're yeah. constantly re reinventing things or thoughtlessly disregarding things. Oh. Uh, we're not just talking about history going back in time hundreds of years. We're talking no. about history going back a dozen years or two dozen years. Yeah, I know. Uh, it was. Um, it, it's it's such a common uh, uh, failing, and, and I, I I would say in, that's my major uh, disappointment with uh, with my teaching career. I I was not able to to get this across to, to any of my students. This love for for that kind of scholarship and reading source materials, I saw a complete failure at passing this on to the people that I worked with the most closely. I don't know uh, what I should have done, but uh, 
uh, let's hope that this, you know, he, when I came to Stanford, I was, uh, uh, I, 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 from Caltech, I had been researching Pascal and I had, and I couldn't find much about Pascal's work in the, in the Caltech library. At Stanford, I found two shelves devoted to it and I was really impressed by that. Then I came to Stanford Engineering Library. Stanford Engineering Library, everything was in storage if it was more than five years old. It was just, a, it was, you know, it was a basket case. At, at that time, in the, in the 60s. Uh, all right, well, I, I've got to restrain myself from not telling uh, uh, too much about the, uh, the early compiler. But anyway, I, 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 after, after IT, uh, I have to mention that, the, uh, uh, that I had a, a job by this time at the Case Computing Center. Uh, I wasn't just drawing graphs for statisticians anymore. And, uh, and Case was one of the uh, uh, very few institutions in the country with a, a, a really enlightened attitude that undergraduate students were allowed to touch the computers by themselves and, and also write software for the whole campus. Um, uh, I, um, Dartmouth was another place, but there was a guy named Fred Way who set the policy at Case, and, uh, inste and instead of going the way most places go, which, which would hire professionals to, uh, to run their computer center, uh, Case hired it, its own students uh, uh, to, uh, to play with the machines and to, and to do the stuff everybody was doing. Um, and so there were about a dozen of us there, and, uh, and uh, we turned out to be uh, uh, fairly good contributors to the computing industry in the, in the long, long range of things. So I told all of my friends how this IT compiler worked, and uh, we got together and, and made our own uh, uh, greatly improved version. Uh, the following year, it was called Runcible. Uh, every, every program in those days had to have a, an, an acronym, and uh, this was the rev revised unified new compiler. It, it basic language extended, or something like this. We found a reason for the, the name, but but uh, uh, we took uh, uh, we added uh, a million bells and whistles to IT basically, and. Um, and all on uh, the 2,000 word drum. All on the 2,000 word drum. Not only that, but we we had four versions of our compiler. Uh, one of them would would compile uh, to assembly language. One would compile directly into machine language. Uh, uh, what, uh, one version would use floating point uh, uh, hardware, and one version would use floating point attachment. And and uh, uh, there were if you change 613 instructions. Uh, uh, it would go from the, the floating point attachment to the floating point hardware version. And if you changed another 372 instructions, uh, 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 it would change from the assembly language version to the machine language version. And, and uh, if we could figure out a way to save a line of code uh, it, in the 373 instructions of one version, then we'd have to figure out a way to correspondingly save another line of code in the other version, then we could uh, uh, have another instruction available to put in a new feature. Um, and so Runcible went through this, uh, uh, the, the uh, stages of, of software development that uh, have, have since become familiar, uh, where, they, where there's uh, uh, what they call creeping featureism, where every user you see wants a new, a, a new thing to be added to the, uh, to the software, and then you put that in, and pretty soon the thing gets, gets uh, have a harder and harder user manual. Um, uh, but that's the way software always has been, and, and, and we, we got our experience of this. And it was a, it was a group of us uh, uh, developing this uh, in, uh, 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 about, eight, uh, I don't know, eight of us worked together on different parts of it, but, uh, but my friend Bill Lynch and I did most of the, of the parts that were, that were uh, uh, the, the compiler itself. Other people were working on the, the subroutines that would, that would support the library and uh, things like that. Um, uh, since I mentioned Bill Lynch, I also, uh, I guess, so, so, so uh, uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a paper about the, the way Runcible worked inside, and it was published in the communication at ACM uh, in, in, during my senior year. Uh, and because we had seen other articles in the, in, in the in this uh, uh, journal that 
describe methods that weren't as good as the ones that were in our compiler. So we thought, okay, let's let's uh, put the word. But uh, I had no idea what scientific publishing was was all about. I had only experienced magazines before, and magazines don't give credit for things; they just tell the news. And so I wrote this article, and I and it explained, uh, you know, how we did how we did it in our in our, in, in our compiler. But I didn't mention Bill Lynch's name or any, or anything. Uh, in the article, and I found out to my great surprise afterwards that I was getting credit for having invented these things when it actually it was a complete uh, it was a completely team effort, and mostly other people. In fact, and I I had just you know uh, uh, caught a few bugs and and uh, and and made you know uh, done done a lot of things, but nothing nothing really very original. So so this was uh, you know. Uh, I had to learn about scholarship. I mean, how, how about scientific uh, publishing and things uh, as part of this story. Now, uh, so we got this uh, experience with users, and I also wrote the user manual for for this uh, machine. I'm not undergraduate case allows me to write the user manual for Runcible, and it's used as it, it's used as textbook in classes. Uh, so here I've got a class that I'm taking. You know, I. I, I I, I can take a class, and I wrote the textbook for it already <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, as an undergraduate. So, so anyway, uh, this this meant that I uh, I had a, 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 um, uh, an, an unusual uh, uh, visibility on campus, I guess, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, and and uh, uh, what actually uh, the truth is that. That case was a really great college for undergraduates, and the, and it had superb teachers, but it did not have very strong standards for graduate studies. And uh, the, the 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 it was easy. It was very difficult to get admitted uh, to undergraduate program at case, uh, and and a lot of people would would flunk out. But uh, in graduate school, it wasn't so, that hard to get to get over. And I uh, I, I noticed this and and. Uh, I started taking graduate courses because they were, there was no competition, uh, and uh, and so uh, uh, this impressed my teachers that oh Knuth is taking graduate courses, you know, not realizing that this was the the line of least resistance, so that I could I could do other things like write, write compilers as I'm a, as I'm as I'm a student, and and I worked on uh, I edited a magazine and things like that, uh, and played in the band and did lots of activity. Um, now. Uh, the story is, however, what about compilers? Well, uh, I uh, I got a job uh, at the end of my senior year to write a compiler for Burroughs, uh, who wanted to uh, who wanted to sell their drum machine to people who had IBM 650s. So Burroughs had this this computer called the 205, uh, which was a drum machine that had 4,000 words of memory instead of 2,000, and uh, and they uh, uh, needed a compiler for it, and and Algol was a new uh, a new language at the time. So they so they uh, so uh, anyway, somebody heard that I knew something about how to write compiler, and Thompson Raymond Wooldridge uh, had a consulting branch in in Cleveland, and uh, they. They approached me uh, it, uh, early on my senior year and said, "Don, we want to make a uh, proposal to Burroughs Corporation that we'll write them a, an Algol compiler, uh, uh, and would you write it for us if if we got the contract?" And so uh, I believe what happened is that they made a proposal to Burroughs for seventy-five thousand dollars. They would write a Algol compiler, and they would and they would pay me uh, uh, five thousand for it, something like this. And um, and Burroughs turned it down. Uh, so then a couple of months, but but meanwhile I had learned about the 205 uh, uh, machine language and it was kind of appealing to me. So I so I made my own proposal to Burroughs and I said I'll write you a Algol compiler uh, for five thousand uh, dollars, but I can't implement all of Algol. For, no, I think I, I can't. I, I told him I can't implement all of Algol for this. I'm just just one guy. Um, uh, let's leave out procedures. Subroutines. Um, well, this is a big hole in the language, um, uh, and Burroughs said, "No, no, you got to put in procedures." And, so, and I said, "Okay, I'll put in procedures, but you got to pay me fifty-five hundred." <laughs> uh, and so that's what happened. So they paid me fifty-five hundred, which was a fairly good salary in those days. I think uh, 
uh, like a, a, a college professor was making uh, eight or nine thousand dollars a year in those days. So, so I, I, I did uh, uh, it, uh, be, between uh, be, between graduating from from Case and going to Caltech, uh, I I worked on this compiler. And as I drove out to California, I I drove a hundred miles a day and I sat in a motel and wrote code. And the coding form in which I wrote this code, I've, I've now do donated to the Computer History Museum, and you can see the exactly the code that I wrote and so on. And I, I debugged it, and it was uh, Christmas time. I had uh, I had the compiler ready for for Burroughs to use. Uh, so I got so I was interested in in you know had, had some uh, two compilers that, that I knew uh, all the code uh, by the end of the 60s, and um, and. Uh, uh, then I um, I learned about other projects. Uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, 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 some people came to me and said, "Don, how about uh, writing software full time? Quit graduate school. Uh, we'll, we'll just name your price. Uh, we will, you know we'll write write compilers for a living, and and uh, you you'll have a pretty good living." And so I was a uh, it was a uh, I was my second year of graduate school, and uh, they in uh, in what department it, at, at Caltech? I was at Caltech in math department. Uh, yeah, the, there was no such thing as a computer science department right. anywhere. But you, you didn't days. do physics, and I didn't do physics. Yes, I switched into math. Uh, uh, I switched into math uh, if, if, after my sophomore year at Case. After flunking welding, <laughs> I switched into math, and uh, and uh, there were only seven of us math majors. At, at case, um, uh, and I went to uh, Caltech. With, with, that's another story we'll get into soon. Um, but I, but on, uh, at, at Caltech, I'm in my second year at Caltech, and I and I was a consultant to Burroughs. Uh, uh, after after finishing my compiler for Burroughs, uh, uh, I joined I, I I joined the product planning department, and the uh, the product planning department was uh, uh, was people who were largely composed of people who had written uh, the, the best uh, software ever done in the world up to that time, which was a Burroughs Al Algol compiler for the 220 computer. Uh, that was a uh, that was a um, uh, 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 great leap forward for software. Uh, it was the first uh, it was the first software that used uh, this this processing of it, uh, and 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 high level data structures in an intelligent way, uh, so they took the ideas of of Newell and Simon and applied them to compilers, and it ran circles around all the other uh, things that we were doing. So I I, I, w I wanted to get to know these people and and then they they were by this time in the product planning group because the Burroughs was doing its very innovative uh, machines that. That are the opposite of risk. They 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 tried to put uh, uh, they tried to make the machine language look like algebraic language, uh, and so the, so this group uh, I joined at Burroughs as a consultant, and um, uh, and uh, I kept my uh, I, I, I kept so I had a programming hat when I was outside of Caltech, and in, at Caltech I'm a mathematician taking my 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 grad. My grad studies, and and uh, so uh, a, a startup company called Green Tree Corporation, uh, because it was green is the color of money, uh, came to me and said, "Don, uh, name your price, uh, write compilers for us, and we will take care of uh, of uh, you know finding computers for you to debug them on and assistance for you to do, do do your work, and name your price." And I so I said, "Oh, okay, a hundred thousand dollars." Assuming that this was, um, I mean, in those, in in in, in that era, uh, this was uh, uh, not quite in Bill Gates's level today, but it's, it was it was sort of out there. And the guy didn't blink, and he said, "Okay," <laughs> you know. And so then, uh, uh, so then I real, you know, so then I I uh, didn't I, I didn't really blink either. And I said, "Well, I, I'm not going to do it." I just thought this was an <laughs> impossible number. So, but that point, I, at that point, I made the decision in my life. Uh, that I wasn't going to op optimize my income, but I was really going to, you know, d do what I thought uh, I could do uh, for. Uh, well, I, I I don't know. If you ask me what 
what makes me most happy, you know, if, 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 number one would be somebody said, I learned something from you, you know, and, and number two would be somebody saying, I used your software. But number infinity would be, you know, um, I, well, no, number infinity minus one would be, I bought your book, uh, you know, it's not as good as I read your book, you know, and then there's, I bought your, you know, your software, you know, that, that was not in, in my, in, in, you know, in, in my uh, uh, own personal priority. So that decision came up in the software. Well, then I, I uh, kept up with the literature about compilers, and I, f and I, uh, 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 because the communication to the ACM was where uh, the action was, and uh, and uh, I start and I uh, also worked with. Uh, with people on trying to debug the algo language, which had which had problems with it, and so I so I published a few papers about uh, about uh, you know like the, the the remaining trouble spots in algo 60 was one of the one of the papers that I worked on, and I I chaired a committee called small gall, which was to find a, a a subset of algo that would work on small computers, and I, so I was active in the programming. Was McCarthy language. on small gall? No, no, uh, I don't think he was. Um, or Clausworth. Uh, uh, no, the they, a lot of people were well. There was a big European group, uh, but the but this was a mostly mostly Americans, and they were uh, and uh, uh, gosh, I I can't remember, but we we had about twenty people as co-authors of the of, of the paper. But it was small ago, sixty one. I don't know, so it was so long ago I can't remember. Uh, but all the authors are there. But there were and you were still a graduate student. I was a graduate student. Yeah. But I, but, but I, 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 this was my computing life. Yeah. What and did your thesis advisors think of all this? Oh, uh, you know, at, at, at Case, they thought it was terrible that I even touched computers. The math, the math professors said, you know, don't dirty your hands with that. It's you just mean Caltech? At, 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 no, first at no, case. case. But at Caltech was one of the few graduate schools that did not have that, uh, that opinion that, that, I sh that I shouldn't touch computers. I, I went to Caltech because they had uh, this uh, strong, strong in combinatorics, and uh, and and they they uh, uh, th their computing system was was incredibly arcane and it was terrible. I couldn't run any programs at Caltech. The only, uh, I mean, they they I, I would have to punch use punched paper tape uh, in order. To, they didn't even have punch cards, and uh, and the, the computing system was horrible unless you. Unless you went to JPL, which was uh, which was quite a bit off, jet propulsion laboratory off campus, and there you would have to submit a job and then come back a day later, and and uh, you couldn't touch the machines or anything. It was just uh, hopeless. What I'd, at Burroughs, uh, I could go into the what they called the fishbowl, which was the demonstration computer room, and I could run their like, hands on every night and 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 get get work done. Uh, uh, I did a. I, I would. I, 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 there was a program that I had debugged in one one night at Burroughs uh, that was solving a, a problem that my that Marshall Hall, my my thesis advisor, was interested in. Uh, but then uh, uh, it it took more memory than the Burroughs machine had, so I had to run that JPL. Well, eight months later, I I had gotten the output from JPL, and I had also accumulated listings that were floor, that, that were 10 feet high, uh, 10 feet high in, in my office uh, because you uh, because the, it, uh, it, it, it's a one or two day turnaround time and then they give you a memory dump at the end of the run uh, and then you can say oh then I'll change this and I'll try another thing tomorrow and so you know it was incredibly inefficient uh, and uh, brain damaged uh, computing at, at, at Caltech in, in the early 60s um, uh, so but I kept track with the with the programming languages c community and I became editor of the programming language section of the communication of the ACM and the journal of the ACM uh, in uh, I don't know 64 65 something like that and so I was not a graduate student at, but I was but I was uh, just uh, just out of graduate school uh, in the 60s so that was that was definitely the the part of computing that uh, uh, that uh, I, I did m by far the most in in, in those days, um, and uh, uh, computing was divided into three ca into three categories. So by the time I came to Stanford, uh, you were either a numerical analyst or artificial intelligence or programming language person. Right. 
and we had three three uh, qualifying exams, and you know there was a tripartite division of of the field. Uh, Don, uh, just before we uh, yeah. we leave your thesis advisor, yeah. uh, your your thesis itself was in mathematics, not in computing, uh, right? And yes. Tell us a little bit about that and what the your thesis advisor's influence on your work yeah, was this at the is time. Yeah, because this is combinatorial, and uh, uh, it's it's uh, definitely in part important part of the story. So. Uh, uh, the, the discrete combinatorics was not a a uh, academic subject uh, at, at at case, uh, and uh, and Caltech uh, was one of the few places that had it as a graduate course, and there were textbooks that began to be ri written. Um, I believe at Stanford, for example, George Danzig introduced the first class in combinatorics, probably about 1970. Um, and uh, it was, you know, it was, it, it was, it was something that was uh, 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 low on the totem pole in the mathematics world in those days. The the high on the totem pole was was the Bourbaki school from from France uh, of, uh, of of highly abstract mathematics that was uh, um, uh, that was invo involved with higher orders of infinities and things too. But that, in other words. Uh, uh, I had colleagues at Caltech, and I would say you and I inter intersect at at countable infinity because I never think of anything that's gr more than countable infinity. You never think of anything that's less than countable infinity. Um, and but I'm I, I mostly stuck to things that were finite <laughs> in, in my own work. But this, but uh, uh, at at Case, when I'm a senior, uh, we had a visiting professor, uh, R. C. Bose from um, from uh, North Carolina, who uh, was a very inspiring lecturer. He was a, he, he was an extremely charismatic guy, and he had just solved a problem that became front page news on the New York Times, and and it was to find uh, orth it's called orthogonal Latin squares. Now today, there's a craze called Sudoku. Uh, uh, but uh, I imagine by the time people are watching this, <laughs> this tapes or listening to this tape, that craze will have, have faded away. But a, a Latin square is uh, an arrangement of, uh, uh, let's say, an n by n Latin square is an arrangement of, the, of n letters. Uh, of, uh, uh, in, in, so it, every row and every column has all, all, n, of the, all n of the letters. And, and, and orthogonal Latin squares, where you have two Latin squares w w with the property that if you, if, if you put the, uh, if, if, if you put them next to each other, um, so you have a symbol from the first and a symbol from the second, the n squared cells you get have all n squared possibilities, all, all combinations of, you know, their a, a will occur with A somewhere, uh, a, a will occur with B somewhere, and, you know, Z will occur with Z somewhere. So these are, now, um, uh, a famous paper from 1770, 1783, I think, anyway, by by Leonard Euler had had uh, conjectured that it was impossible to find orthogonal Latin squares that were 10 by 10, or 14 by 14, or 18 by 18, and and uh, any any uh, uh, well six by six, all the cases that were that were a, a twice an odd number. And um, and uh, this conjecture was believed f for uh, you know 170 years, and uh, and even had been proved three times, but the people found holes in the proof. Um, so in 1959, R. C. Bose and, and and two other people uh, found that it was wrong, and they constructed Latin squares that were 10 by 10 and 14 by 14. They they, they showed that they, all those cases. Uh, uh, were actually it was possible to find orthogonal Latin square. Um, so I met Bose at the he I, I was taking a class from him and uh, because it was a graduate class and I was taking graduate classes and uh, uh, he he asked me uh, if I could find some 12 by 12 orthogonal Latin squares uh, and uh, it sounded like an interesting program so I wrote it up and and I and I, I presented him with the answer in the next morning uh, and he was happy and impressed and we found five mutual orthogonal Latin squares of order 12 and that was you know that became a, pup, a, a, a paper some interesting the stories about that I won't go into that they the the main thing is um, 
uh, he was a, uh, you know, he, he was on the cutting edge of, of, of this research. And I was at an undergraduate place where we had great teaching, but we didn't have cutting edge researchers. Uh, so he could recommend me to graduate school. And he could also tell me, you know, um, Marshall Hall is very good at, at combinatorics, uh, you know, and uh, he, so he gives me a good plug for going to Caltech. Um, I had visited uh, California with my parents uh, on, on summer vacations, uh, and uh, so when I applied to graduate school, I applied to uh, Stanford, Berkeley, and Caltech, uh, and no other no other places. And uh, and uh, when I got admitted to Caltech, I got admitted to all all three. Uh, but the uh, but uh, I took Caltech because the, because I knew that they had good, uh, good combinatorial. Uh, uh, attitude there, which was not really true at Stanford. In fact, Stanford, I wouldn't have been able to study Latin squares at all. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, well, well, right, I might as well mention that the that I got fellowships. I got National Science Foundation fellowship, Woodrow Wilson Foundation fellowship to come to these places. But I took, but they all had the requirement that you could not uh, do anything except study as a graduate student. Uh, I couldn't be a consultant to Burroughs and also have an NSF fellowship, so I so I turned down the, the fellowships. Um, now, uh, so so Marshall Hall was then my my thesis advisor, and he was the, he was a, uh, uh, a world class mathematician and and had done a f f for a long time pioneering work in, in combinatorics. So so he was a. Uh, so, so he was my my mentor, and uh, but it was a funny thing because uh, I was such in awe of him that when I was in the same room with him, I could not think straight. I I wouldn't remember my name. You know, I would write down what he was saying, and then I go back to my office so that I could figure it out. Uh, I, it was a you know we couldn't do joint research together in the same in the same room. We could do it. We could do it back and forth. It was almost like farming my programs out to JPL to be run, um, uh, but we did collaborate on a few on a, on a few things. And uh, the one thing that we did the most on actually never got published, however, because uh, it turned out that it just didn't lead to the. I mean, he thought he had a way to solve Burnside problem in group theory, which uh, but it didn't it didn't pan out. And so after we did all the computation. It, it, uh, uh, I, I learned a lot in the process, but, I, but none of these programs have ever uh, described, in, bit, appeared in print or anything. I just, uh, you know, it, it taught me how to deal with tree structures inside a machine, and I, I used the techniques in other, in other things over the years. Um, uh, so, so that was. It, he, w he also was an extremely good advisor that he would. Uh, that I, I, in better ways than I was with my students, that he would seem to to keep track of of me to make sure I wasn't slipping. I would uh, when I was working with my own graduate students, I was pretty much in a, uh, uh, in, a in a mode where they would bug me, and I, instead of me bugging them. And he was, but he would you know he would actually you know write me notes and say, Don, why don't you do such and such? Now my thesis was a I, I, I chose a thesis topic. Um, which was to find uh, a certain kind of what they call block designs. Uh, the the uh, I'll just say symmetric block designs with parameter lambda equals two, and anybody can look that up and find out what that means. I don't want to explain it now, but uh, uh, at the time I did this, there were uh, I, I believe there were six known designs of this form altogether, uh, and I had found a new way to look at those designs, and so I thought maybe I'll be able to find infinitely many more such designs. Uh, and they would, they would be mostly academic interest, although statisticians would, would justify that they could use them somehow, but mostly just for the, you know, do they exist or not? This was the, the, the question, uh, uh, purely uh, intellectual curiosity. And, um, and so that was going to be my, my thesis topic. Uh, to see if I could if I could find uh, uh, lots of these of, of, of these elusive uh, combinatorial patterns, uh, but one morning um, uh, I I received a I, I I was looking at another uh, uh, another problem entirely having having to do with project finite projective geometry, 
and uh, I got a listing from a from a guy at Princeton who had just computed uh, 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 th 32 solutions to a, a, a problem that I had uh, been, been looking at with, with respect to the homework problem in, in my class, uh, in my combinatorics class. Um, and, and he had found that th there are 32 uh, solutions of type A and 32 solutions of type B to this particular problem. Um, and, and I and I said, hmm, that's interesting because of the, the 32 solutions of type A, one of those was a well-known uh, was, was a well-known construction. The 32 of type B, uh, nobody had ever found uh, uh, any type B solutions before f for the next case, uh, for, for the next higher, higher up case. And so I said to, so I, so I remember I was, I was, uh, I had just gotten this listing from Princeton and, um, and I was riding up on the elevator with, with uh, 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 Olga Todd, uh, one of our professors, and I said, Mrs. Todd, I think I'm going to have a theorem in an hour. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to look at these two, two, two lists of 32 numbers. I'm going to find, uh, uh, I'm going to, for every one on this page, I'm going to find a corresponding one on this page. I'm going to find the, I'm going to psych out the rule that, that explains why there are th happen to be 32 of each kind. And sure enough, an hour later, I had, I had, I had seen how to get from each solution on, on the first page to the solution on the second page. I showed this to Marshall Hall. He said, oh, Don, that's your thesis. Don't, don't worry on this lambda equal two business. Uh, uh, you know, write this up and get out of here. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so that became my thesis. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's a good thing because uh, since then, only one more design of, with lambda equals two has been discovered in the history of the world. So I might still be working on my my thesis if I, if I had stuck to that problem. Um, well, I felt a little guilty that I, that I had solved my PhD problem in one hour. Um, and so I, you know, I, 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 I dressed it up with a few other chapters of, uh, of uh, stuff, but the whole thesis is 70 some pages long and I, I, I discovered that it's, it's now on the internet. I, I just probably for pe uh, people's curiosity, I suppose, uh, what, did he, what did he write about in those days? But, uh, but of all the uh, areas of mathematics that I've applied to computer science, uh, I would say the only area that I've never applied to computer science is the one that I did my thesis in. Uh, 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 it's uh, <laughs> it just was, was good training for me to, 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 to exercise the, you know, my brain cells. Yeah, that's, uh, in fact, for your colleagues, that's kind of a black hole in their, in their knowledge of you and understanding of you is that yeah. that thesis the thesis yeah well but it's i do let, can it, I? yeah that's fine no go ahead well, i was going to say the reason that it's not used anymore is because these designs turn out that okay we can construct them uh with all this pain and and c careful you know deep uh, analysis but uh it, it turned out later on that if we just work at random uh, uh we get even better results so, so, so it was kind of pointless from the point of view of ap applications, in, in, uh, f except for certain codes and things like that. <clears throat> uh, Don, just a, a footnote to that story. Uh, mm. I intended this would come up later in the mm. interview, but, but it's, uh, it's just so yeah. great a point to bring it in. Uh, when I've been advising graduate students, I tell them that the really hard part of the thesis is finding the right problem. If that's mm. at least half the problem, yeah. and then the other half is just doing it, yeah. and that's the easy part of it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not impressed by this one hour. I mean, the, the hard part went into finding the, the problem, not in yeah. the, the solving of it. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, we'll, we'll get to, of course, the, the great uh, piece of work that you did on the art of computer programming, but it's always seemed to me that the, that the uh, writing Researching and then writing the text of the art of computer programming was a problem generator for you. Uh, yeah. The way you and I have expressed it in the past is that uh, you were weaving a fabric and you would encounter holes in the fabric and those would be the great problems to solve. And that's more than half the work of, yeah. w once you find the problems, you can go get at them. Do you want to comment right. on that? Well, uh, yeah, we'll, pro we'll probably comment on it more, more in the, in, in, Later too, but uh, the uh, I, I guess one of the the 
the blessings and curses of the way I uh, the way I work is is that I that I don't have prob I, I don't have difficulty think of thinking of questions uh, think th things that I that, that, you know uh, uh, I, I don't ha I have too much difficulty in the problem generation phase uh, what to work on um, I'm, I'm, I'm I have to actively suppress stimulation so that I'm not working on too many things at once and I, that, it, it, uh, um, uh, but but you can ask you can ask questions uh, that are the, the hard thing is not to, for me anyway, is, is not to find a problem, but to find a good problem, to find a problem that has some, some uh, 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 juice to it, so, something that, that will, will uh, uh, not just be isolated, uh, it's just something that happens to be true uh, uh, um, now, uh, but, but also will, will be something that, uh, that, that, the, that will have spin-offs, that, that, that there will be, you know, the, w w w once you've solved the problem, the, the techniques are going to apply to, to many other things, or that, th that this, will be a, this, this will be a link in a chain to, to other things. It's not just having a, having a question that needs an answer. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's very easy to, uh, there's a, um, there's a uh, uh, professor, uh, I might as well mention his name, although I, you know, I, I don't like to, uh, it, it would be uh, it's hard to it would be hard to, to, to mention the concept without somebody thinking of his name. But his his, his name is Smarandash. I've never met him, but he, he he generates problems by the zillions, and I've never seen one of them that, that I thought had any merit in, in it whatsoever. I mean, you can you can uh, uh, you, you can generate sequences of numbers in various ways, and you know you can you can cube them and remove the middle digit or something like this. You know, and they say, oh, is this prime? Something like that. so. So th there's there's all kinds of ways of of, of, of defining you know, sequences of numbers or patterns of things and saying uh, and then asking a question about it. And and those are and but but uh, if one of my students say I want to work on this for the thesis, you know, I would have to say this 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 problem stinks. Uh, so the the hard thing is to is not to come up with a problem, but to but to come up with a a. a, a, a a, fr a fruitful problem, and uh, like the, the the famous problem of Fer Fermat's last theorem, the you know does it, it, can a, can there be a a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n for n greater than two? Uh, uh, it has no no um, uh, applications. So so you found a, b, and c. It doesn't really matter to anything, but. Uh, in, in the course of working on this problem, people discovered beautiful things about uh, about mathematical structures that have that have solved you know, uh, 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 uncountably many many practical applications uh, as a spin-off. So so you know you. The, the, the that's one and and I um, my thesis problem that I solved was was uh, um, probably not in that sense though uh, extremely interesting either it was it, 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 it answered a question whether there existed um, <coughs> Projective geometries of cer certain orders that did that <coughs> that weren't symmetrical, and you know, all the, all the cases that people had ever thought of were symmetrical, and I thought of unsymmetrical ways to do it. Well, so what? But uh, it, but the technique that I used for it was still uh, led to some insight and some and 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 got got around some other blocks that people had in, in other theories. It's uh, it, it it's a. Uh, 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 though I, I have to, I have to worry about not getting bogged down in 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 every question that I think of, because otherwise I can't move on and get anything out the door. <laughs> yeah. So Don, uh, around this time, uh, we've gotten a little mixed up between the finishing of your thesis and the and your assistant mm -hmm. professorship at Caltech, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. Uh, around this time, uh, there was the embryonic. Uh, beginnings of uh, a multi-volume work which you're known for, The Art of Computer Programming. 
And could you tell us the, uh, the story about the beginning? Because soon it's going to be the middle of it. Uh, you, yeah, you were well, working on it so fast. Yeah, this is, this is uh, of course, really the story of my life because uh, I, I hope to live long enough to finish it, but I may, but, but I may not because it's such a, turned out to be such a huge project. But I, I, had, uh, I got married in uh, the, the summer of 1961. Uh, after my first year of graduate school, my wife just got, then, then she finished college, and I could use the money I had made on that, you know, the $5,000 on that compiler to, to finance a trip to Europe for our honeymoon. And we, and we had uh, uh, four months of wedded bliss in, uh, in, in uh, Southern California. Um, and then a man from Addison Wesley came to visit me and said, Don, we would like you to write a book about how to write compilers, um, and uh, I, uh, the more I thought about it, I decided, oh yes, uh, I've got this book inside of me. I sketched out that day. I, I still have the sheet of tablet paper on which I, wrote. I I sketched out twelve chapters that I thought would ought to be in, in such a book, and uh, and I told Jill, my wife, uh, I think I'm going to write a book. And as I say, we had four months of bliss because after you know the rest of our marriage has all been <laughs> devoted to this book. Um, and um, uh, well, we get we still have have, have happiness, but I mean it was it, it <laughs> but uh, really this this is uh, uh, the you know I wake up every morning and I'm still haven't finished the book, um, and so and so uh, uh, I try to. Uh, 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 you know, I I uh, have to have to organize the rest of my life around this as the as the as as one main unifying uh, theme. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the the book was supposed to be about how to write a compiler, and they had heard about me from from one of their editorial advisors that I you know that I knew something about how, how to do this. Um, and uh, the idea appealed to me for two main reasons. One is that I did uh, enjoy writing. I had, uh, I, I had uh, in, in high school, I had been editor of the, of the weekly uh, paper. In college, I was editor of the scientific science magazine and, did, uh, and I worked on the, uh, on the, uh, on the campus paper, uh, uh, copy editor. And uh, I was writing. Uh, you know, I told you I wrote the manual for the, you know, for that compiler that we that we wrote. And so I, I enjoyed, uh, uh, I, I I enjoyed writing. And uh, 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 so so number one, I I, I also I, Edison Wesley was the people who who were asking me to do this book. My favorite textbooks had been published by Edison Wesley. Uh, I had. I, you know, my, they, they had done the, the books that I, that I loved the most as a student, and, I, and for them to come to me and say, wow, would you write a book for us? And here I am, you know, just a second year graduate student. Um, uh, this, was, this was a thrill. Um, uh, another very important reason uh, at the time was that I, uh, that I knew that there was a great need for a book about compilers because there were, there were a lot of people who had been, who were, even in 1962, they were, this was January 1962, even in, in 1962, people were starting to rediscover the wheel. There were, the, 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 the knowledge was out there, but it wasn't, it hadn't been explained. And the, the, and the, and, uh, the people who had discovered it, though, were scattered all over the world, and they didn't, they didn't know of each other's work either very much. I had been following, I mean, and everybody I could think of who could write a book about compilers, um, as far as I could see, they would only, they would only give a piece of the fabric. They, they would, they would slant it to, to their own uh, uh, view of it, and, the, and so there, were, there might be four people who could write about it, but they would write four different books that would, and I, I could present all four of their viewpoints in, in what I would think was a balanced way, without any ax to grind, without any, uh, you know, without slanting it to, uh, towards, towards something that I thought would, would, would be uh, misleading to the, to, to the compiler writers of the future. So, so I, I, I considered m myself 
as a as a journalist essentially I mean I, I could be a, a expositor a tech writer that would that, that that could do uh, the job that was needed in order to in order to take the work of these brilliant people and and make it uh, accessible to the um, uh, to the audience to to the audience, to the world, and uh, so that was my my um, uh, motivation. Now I didn't have time, much time to spend on it. Uh, uh, then I just had this had this page of paper with twelve chapter uh, headings on it, uh, and that's all I could do. For uh, th uh, that's all I could do uh, uh, while I'm while I'm a consultant at Burroughs and doing my graduate work. I signed a contract. But uh, uh, but they they said we know you, it'll take you a while, um, and um, so I, I I didn't really begin to have much time to work on it for uh, in, in, until 1963, my third year of graduate school, as I'm as I'm uh, already uh, finishing up on my thesis, and. Um, uh, in the summer of '62, I, I guess I should mention I wrote a com I wrote another compiler. Uh, this was for Univac. It was a Fortran compiler, and uh, and I spent the summer. Uh, I sold my soul to uh, to uh, the, um, the the devil, I guess you say, for th for three months in the summer of 1962 to write a Fortran compiler, and I believe that this salary for that was fifteen thousand dollars, which was. Uh, uh, m much more than a, uh, a assistant professor. I think assistant professors were getting eight or nine thousand in, in in those days. Anyway, it was well. When I started in 1960 at Berkeley, I was getting seventy six hundred dollars for the nine month year. Yeah. Okay. So so you you see. So I got fifteen thousand dollars for a summer job in 1962, <coughs> writing a Fortran compiler. Um, and one day during that summer. I was writing the I, I was writing the, uh, the the part of the compiler that, that looks up identifiers in a hash table, and the the method that we used uh, is called linear probe, probing, and uh, and uh, it and uh, you you uh, uh, basically you take the you you take the uh, the, the the variable name that you want to look up, uh, you scramble it. Uh, into a in, into a like you 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 square it or something like this, and then you and that gives you a number between one and and uh, well in those days it would have been between one and a thousand, and uh, and then you you look there and if you find it uh, good, uh, if you don't find it, go to the go to the next place and keep on going until you uh, until you either get to an empty place or you found the number you're looking for. It's called linear probing, and and uh, there was a rumor that. That one of uh, Professor Feller's students at Princeton had s tried to figure out how fast linear probing works, and uh, and w was unable to succeed. So here was a th this was a new thing for me. It was a case where I was doing programming, uh, but I was also I had a mathematical problem that that would that would 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 would, 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 would go into my, my other. You know, my, my winter job was was being a math student. My summer job was writing compilers. There was no mic there, these worlds did not intersect at all in in, in my life uh, at, at that point. And so I spent one day uh, during the summer while writing the compiler, uh, looking at the mathematics of how fast does linear pro probing work, and got lucky and I solved the problem. Uh, I, fi I I I figured out uh, the, uh, some, some some math and I you know I. I made, I uh, kept a, two or three sheets of paper with me, and uh, and I typed it up, um, and I guess that's on the internet now because this this became the this became really the the genesis of my my, my main research work, which which developed not to be compi working on compilers, but to be working on what we call analysis of algorithms. Uh, the, which is, you know, take have have a, have a computer method and find out uh, uh, how good is it uh, quantitatively. I, so I could say, uh, if I got so many things to look up in the table, how long is linear probing going to take? Uh, take, and uh, it dawned on me that the uh, that this was just one of many algorithms that would be important, and and each one would lead to a fascinating mathematical problem. And so this was easily a good lifetime uh, source of of rich problems to work on. Um, 
And uh, okay, so I'm so here I am then in the middle of 1962 writing this Fortran compiler, and I had one day to do the research and the mathematics that changed my life for for, uh, for my future research trend, uh, uh, trends. Uh, but now I've gotten off the topic. What your original question well, was? Well, so <laughs> the um, uh, we were talking about sort of the. the you talked about the embryo of oh, yeah, the art of, uh, the art of com yeah. computer, so but then it, the, the compiler book uh, morphed right. into the art of computer programming, well, which became a seven-volume Exactly, yeah. Plan. So, so, so anyway, I, I'm working on a compiler, and I'm thinking about this. Well, then I, but now, as I, now I'm starting, after I finished this summer job, then I began to, uh, uh, to, to do things that were going to be relating to the book. And, wh and one of the things I knew I had to have in the book was a uh, artificial machine. That I, because I'm writing a compiler book, but, but machines are changing faster than I can write books. So I have to have a machine that, that I'm totally in control of. And so I, I invented this machine called Mix, which was typical of the computers of, the, of 1962. Um, and uh, in 1963, I, 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 I wrote a simulator for Mix so that I could write sample programs for it. And I taught a class at Caltech on how to, how to write programs in, in assembly language for this, for this hypothetical computer. Uh, then I started writing the parts of, uh, uh, that, that dealt with sorting problems and, and, and searching problems like the searching, like the linear probing idea. So, so I began to write those, those parts which are part of a compiler um, uh, of the book. Uh, and I had, uh, and, and I had a, a bunch of, uh, I had uh, several hundred pages of notes on, on, uh, on, on, on gathering for those chapters of the art of computer programming uh, developing uh, while I'm really before that's before I uh, graduated I've I've already done done uh, uh, quite a bit of writing on the art of computer programming um, and I and uh, I met George Forsyth about this time uh, George uh, was the man who inspired both of us to come to Stanford uh, during the during the 60s and George uh, uh, came down to Southern California for a talk, and I met, and and uh, and he said, "Oh, come up, to, you know, come up to Stanford, and and uh, and uh, how about joining our faculty?" And uh, and I said, "Oh no, I can't do that. I've just gotten married, I, and I've got to finish this book first. And so I said, "You know, I think I'll finish the book next year, and then I can come up. You know, and I start thinking about uh, about the the rest of my life. But I get this book." Book done before. I want to get my book done before my son is born. Um, well, you know, John is now forty some years old, and I'm not done with the book. But this is uh, part of my uh, lack of expertise. Is is uh, any any uh, uh, any good estimation procedure as to how long projects are going to take? I I, I uh, way underestimated the how much needed to be written about in in, in this. In this book, well, I, anyway, I started writing the, the, the manuscript, and I, I went merrily along, um, writing pages and uh, of things that I thought were uh, really needed to be said. And of, and of course, it didn't take long before I I had I, I I had started to uh, discover a few things of my own that weren't in any any of the ex uh, existing li literature. So so. Um, I did have an axe to grind. I, 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 the, the, method, the message that I was presenting was, in fact, not going to be unbiased at all. It was going to be, it was going to be based on my own particular slant on stuff, and and uh, and, and that original reason for why I should write the book uh, uh, became impossible to uh, to sustain. Uh, but it, but but it 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 gave me an, but this I, this fact that I had worked on linear probing and solved the problem gave me a new unifying theme for the book. I was going to. I, I was going to base it around this idea of analyzi uh, analyzing algorithms and, and, and had some quantitative uh, ideas about about how good th how good methods were, not just that they that they worked, but but that they worked well. And and this m method worked three times better than this method, or 3.1 times better than this method. And, and, and uh, so I I also uh, uh, at this time I was learning mathematical techniques that I had never been taught in school. I found they were out there, but they just hadn't been emphasized uh, in the uh, openly uh, about how to solve problems of this kind. So my book would also present a different kind of mathematics than was common in the in in, in the curriculum at the time. 
uh, in, uh, that was very relevant to analysis of algorithms. I went to the publishers, I went to Addison Wesley and said, uh, how about changing the, 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 the title of the book from Art of Computer Programming to anal The Analysis of Algorithms? And they, they said, that'll never sell. You know, their, their focus group couldn't buy that one. Um, and uh, so it's, I'm glad they, 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 they stuck to the, the original title, although I'm also glad to see that several books have now come out <laughs> With what are called the analysis of algorithms, uh, you know, 20 years down the line. But in those days, uh, the, the art of computer programming is very important because I, I'm thinking of the aesthetical, the 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 the, um, the the whole the whole question of writing programs as something that uh, that is uh, that has artistic aspects in in all senses of the word art, including the the one set the the one idea is art. As, which means artificial, and the other art means fine art. Uh, so the, all these are long stories, but I, but I, 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 I got to cover it fairly quickly. I've got the art of computer programming started out, and I got and I'm working on my 12 chapters, and I finished a rough draft of all ch 12 chapters by I think it was like uh, 1965. I've got 3,000 pages of notes. Uh, and and um, about this, <coughs> and uh, um, in, including in, in these notes, uh, uh, um, a very good example of what you mentioned about uh, seeing holes in the fabric. So, so one of the most important chapters in the book is is parsing, the going from a, a, somebody's algebraic formula and figuring out the structure of the formula, just the way I had done in seventh grade. Uh, finding the structure of English sentences, I have to do this with with mathematical sentences, and the uh, and so I have chapter ten is all about parsing of context-free languages, what we uh, what we call it at the time, and I and I covered what what people had published about context-free uh, languages and parsing, um, and I got to the end of the chapter, and you know I said, well. Uh, you can combine these ideas and these ideas, and all of a sudden you get uh, a, 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 a unifying thing, which which goes all the way to the limit. These these other ideas had sort of gone part way there. Um, they would say, "Oh, if if a grammar satisfies this condition, I can do it efficiently. If the grammar satisfies this condition, I can do it efficiently." But now, I, all of a sudden, I saw there was a way to say, you know. I can find the most general condition that can be done efficiently uh, without look ahead, with, without look, without looking ahead to the end of the sentence, uh, that you could that you could make a decision uh, on the fly, reading from left to right, uh, about what the structure of the uh, of the uh, of the, of the thing, um, and uh, <coughs> I. Uh, uh, and that was that was just an, a natural outgrowth of seeing the different pieces of the fabric that that other people had had, had put together and and uh, m writing it into a into a chapter for the first time. Uh, um, and I uh, but I felt that this that this um, uh, this general concept I I couldn't well I I I didn't feel that I had surrounded the concept I. I knew that I had it, and I, and I could prove it, and I could check it, but I couldn't really intuit it all in, in my head. I didn't, you know, I, I knew it was right, but I didn't, but it was too hard f for me really to explain it to it uh, well. Um, and uh, so I, uh, and, and uh, so I, I, I didn't put it in the art of computer programming. I thought it was beyond the scope of my book. It was, but it, w it was, you know, something that I, that, that you know, textbooks don't, ha don't you know, don't have to cover everything <laughs> when, when 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 you get to the harder theorems then then, then you have to go to the literature and uh, my idea I at that time I'm writing this book and I'm and I'm thinking it's going to be published uh, uh, very soon so so any little uh, any little things I discover and put in the book uh, I didn't bother to write up a, a, a paper and publish in a journal because I figure it'll be in my book very soon anyway um, and uh, and in a computer 
science is changing so fast. Uh, my book is, you know, my book is bound to be obsolete. It takes a year for it to go through editing and people drawing the illustrations, and then they have to print it and bind it and so on. So, so I, I might, as, I have to be a little bit ahead of the state of the art if I, if my book isn't going to be obsolete when it comes out. So I, I kept most of the stuff to myself that I would, that I had been the little ideas I'd been coming up with. Um, but when, when I got to this idea of left to right parsing, uh, uh, I, I said, well, here's something I don't really understand very well, so I'll publish this. Let other people figure out what it was, and then they can tell me what I, you know, what I should have said. And, and, uh, and so, I, uh, uh, so I, I published that paper, I believe, in 1965. Um, at the end of finishing the chapter of my draft of the chapter, which which didn't uh, get as far as that story, LRK. Well, well, now textbooks of computer science start with LRK, yeah. you know, at at, so at and, and, and take off from there. But that that's the that I, I want to give you an idea Doug, of for the, historical reasons yeah. for the audience. Yeah. Tell uh, tell the audience where the uh, LRK paper was published, so they it, can go look it up. Yeah, it was published in the journal called. Information and Control, which has now changed its name to Information and Computation. Um, but in, the, in those days, you can see why they call it Information yeah. and Control. Um, and it was, the pap it was the journal that had had the, most, uh, the best papers on parsing of, of, uh, of languages and, uh, uh, at, at the time. And so you know, it's a long paper and difficult. To, uh, <laughs> um, I've, uh, um, but I, but anyway, it's also reprinted in my, in my book, uh, uh, selected papers on computer languages, which, uh, uh, with uh, uh, a few corrections to the uh, to the original. And in the original, I drew the trees with the root at the bottom, but everybody draws trees with the root at the top now. So the so the reprint has the has trees drawn in a more modern notation. <coughs> um, yeah, so, I, so I'm trying to give the, 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 the flavor of the way things were in 1965. My son was born in summer of 65, and, uh, and I finished this, uh, this work on LRFK at Christmas time in 65. Um, and, uh, uh, and then I had, uh, 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 I think, one more chapter to write. Uh, and, uh, sorry, but uh, but earlier in, in '66, I got, I had all 3,000 pages of the manuscript uh, ready, and so I typed, I I, I typed chapter one, and uh, uh, and and I my idea was I looked at these pages. These pages are all handwritten, um, and it, and it looked to me like you know uh, my handwriting. I, I I would guess that was you know that that. Uh, how many words there were on a page, um, and I and I typed it up, and I uh, and I found out that you know, and, and I had chapter one, and I typed it, and I sent it to the publishers, and they said, Don, what have you written here? Uh, this book is going to be huge. I, I had I actually written them a letter earlier as I'm working on sorting. I I said uh, to, to the guy who signed me who signed me up. I, I signed the contract with him, and by this time he had been promoted. No, I'm not sure about this, but anyway, I, I, I wrote to him in 63 or 64 saying, you know, as, I, as I'm working on this book on compilers, there's a few other tech, there's a, there's a few things that, that deserve a, you know, a, a more complete treatment than a compiler writer needs to know. Do you mind if I, you know, add a little bit to here? And they said, sure, Don, go right ahead. Uh, uh, whatever you think is, 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 is good to write about, uh, do it. So then I send them chapter one a few years later. By this time, I guess the guy is promoted and, and he's saying, oh my goodness, um, what are we going to do? This, did you realize that this, that this, you know, that this book is going to be more than 2,000 pages long or something like this? And, and uh, no, I didn't. I, um, I thought, I, you know, I had read a lot of books and I thought I, thought I understood about uh, things and I, and I had my type pages on there and I, and I was figuring five type pages would go into one page of text. It just looked about the, that. It just looked to me, to my eyes, if I had five typewritten pages, that you know the letters in a textbook are, are, are smaller. Uh, but uh, but I should have realized that that the guys at the publishing house knew knew something about books too, and uh, 
and, uh, and they told me, no, no, it was one and a half pages of, of text uh, uh, makes a, 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 a book. Um, and I didn't believe it. I, I, so I went back to my, to my calculus book, which has some Wesley book, and I typed it out. And sure enough, they were absolutely right. You know, it took it, 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 uh, one and a half pages. So I had a, I had a uh, you know, three times longer. Uh, uh, no wonder it had taken me so long to write ch chapter, get chapter one done. And, and I, so I, I, I'm sitting here with, uh, with, with much, much more than I thought I had. Uh, uh, meanwhile, the computer science hasn't been standing still. And so I knew that, the, that, the, that there's more still has to be written um, as, I, as I go. So we have a, <coughs> so they, uh, I, I went to Boston uh, and, and they, I, I, I know, uh, um, I happened to catch a glance at, the, at, at, at some notes that my uh, editor had written to himself uh, if, uh, for the meeting that we were going to have with his bosses, and, and and one of the comments on there was terrific cost bind, or something like that. And uh, publishing houses all have their horror stories about a professor who writes, a, you know, twelve volumes about the the uh, the history of an egg or something like this, and and it never sells, and it just uh, mm -hmm. it's just a, a, a terrible thing that they have a contract that they've signed, and so they had to figure out how to how to rescue something out of this situation. I come. You know, come who's coming with this monster book. Well, um, so we, we, we thought at first we would, we would package it into three, into three volumes uh, instead of one. Um, and uh, then um, they sent out uh, the, the chapter one to a dozen readers, a focus group, and they, they got comments on it. And uh, uh, well, the, the readers liked it. Uh, what they saw in that chapter, and so they, so I at least I had some support from them, and they, and so then they, uh, after a few more months, we decided to package it as seven. They they figured out of the twelve chapters, there were seven of them that would sell, and we could stick the other five in in, in some way that would make a pretty decent seven volume um, uh, set, and so that was the. That that was what was finally announced in uh, in 1966 or something that that it would come out in, in seven volumes. Um, the the uh, uh, I, after ch after typing chapter one, I typed chapter two, and then I and so on. Uh, and I kept working on it uh, uh, all the time when I'm not teaching my classes at Caltech. I'm I'm typing up. Uh, uh, my notes and polishing the, the handwritten notes that I had made from these 3,000 uh, pages of rough draft. Um, that sets the scene for the early days of the art of computer programming, right? <coughs> and, so and what year are we, are so, we at so, now? So, I, so what happened is um, I'm at Caltech, I'm a math professor, I'm teaching classes in I, I, I'm teaching classes in uh, in uh, algebra and uh, once in a while combinatorics at Caltech and and, uh, and, uh, and uh, also one or two classes c connected with with computing uh, like sorting. I think I, I might have taught one one quarter, uh, but most of the things I'm teaching at Caltech are are orthogonal to the art of computer programming. Um, and I'm at and and my my daughter is born in. In December of '66, um, uh, I've got the I, I've got the entire manuscript of Volume One to the publisher. Uh, I think um, uh, during '66, and I'm working on on uh, chap on, on typing up chapters three and four um, uh, at the beginning of '67. I think this is approximately the the way things the, the way things stand. So I was trying to finish the book before my son was born in '65, and uh, and what happened is that I got, you know, so, so I'm I'm sitting now. The volume one actually turned out to be almost 700 pages, which means a thousand typewritten pages, um, and <clears throat> and uh, uh, my uh, you can see why I said that uh, 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 my my blissful marriage wasn't quite so blissful because because you know I'm working on this uh, 
uh, a lot. I mean, I, I, I'm doing most of it actually watching the Late Late Show on television. And I have uh, also some uh, earplugs uh, for when the kids are, are screaming a, a little bit too, uh, too much. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm here I am typing the art of computer programming when the babies are crying, although I did also change diapers and, <laughs> and so on. Um, the, so yeah, go ahead. I, I think that uh, uh, <clears throat> what we need to do is uh, talk about, uh, this is December 66 when your daughter yeah. was born, yeah. and that leads sort of directly into this uh, magical year of 1967, which yeah. didn't end so magically. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's continue right. on uh, with 1967 uh, in a moment. Okay. So, uh, Don, uh, uh, once so. you uh, told me that 1967 was your most creative year, and I'd like to get into it, and uh, you also said you had only a very short time to do your research during that year, and, yeah. and, it, and the year didn't end so well for you. So let's talk yeah, about that. Well, it's, a, it's certainly a pivotal year in my life, and, uh, and uh, you can see in retrospect why things were building up to a, to a crisis, uh, because I was, uh, I was just uh, uh, working uh, at high pitch all the time. I mean, I, I think I mentioned I was editor of, the, of, 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 the, of you know, ACM Communications and ACM Journal. Uh, in the programming languages sections, um, and I took the editorial duties very seriously. I, I had, a lot of people were submitting papers, and I would write long referee reports in many cases, um, as well as uh, you know discussing with with with, with referees uh, the things that had to be done. I was a consultant to Burroughs um, on innovative uh, machines. Um, I was. Uh, consumed with uh, getting the art of computer programming done, and I had, and I had uh, uh, children, uh, and being a father and husband, um, uh, and uh, uh, so I would start out every day, and I would say, "Well, what am I going to accomplish today?" And then I would stay up until I finished it. And and I used to be able to do this so, you know, when I was in high school. I was editor of the of the paper. I would do an all nighter. Every week, when when the when the paper uh, came out, and, and I just go without sleep uh, on, um, on, the, on those occasions, um, and so I was sort of you know used to working in this in this mode where uh, where I didn't realize I was punishing my body, um, and uh, uh, I could uh, uh, I mean we didn't have iPods and things like that, but I did. But but still, I, I had the TV on. You know that would that was enough to to uh, kill the boredom of the. Well, I had to do the typing at, of 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 a lot of material, um, and and uh, uh, now uh, in 1967 is when things came to a head. Uh, also, I. What, it was time for me to make a career decision. I, uh, as I was getting offers, from people were offering me. F you know, I mean, I, I think I was offered full professorships at at uh, uh, North Carolina in, in Chapel Hill, and also in, in at Purdue, I think. And and I had to make a decision as to what I should do. For I mean, I'm a, I must. I was promoted to, to associate professor at Caltech. Um, uh, surprisingly early, but the, but anyway, uh, the question is, what should I, where should I spend the rest of my life? Uh, should I be a mathematician? Should I be a computer scientist? By this time, I had learned that there was actually possible to be, to do mathematical work as a computer scientist. You know, I had analysis of algorithms to, uh, uh, to do, um, and. Uh, uh, so, so what would be a permanent home? And I had visited Stanford. I gave a talk about my left to right parsing. Uh, I, I, I discovered a theorem about it in, in sitting in, uh, in in one of the student dormitories, Stern Hall, <laughs> or where there was dormitory the night before I gave the lecture. Anyway, I, I, I came up there. I liked George Forsyth very much. I liked the people that I met here uh, very much. And uh, so I was thinking Stanford would be a nice place, but also there were other places too that I should, that, that I wanted to check out carefully. 
and and so I was uh, I was also trying to think about what to do uh, you know long term for my uh, for my permanent home I, I, I don't like to move uh, so I thought uh, so so my model of my life was going to be that I was going to make one move in my lifetime uh, to a place where I had tenure and I would stay there uh, forever and so I wanted to check all these things out so I started to um, uh, you know, so I was look, uh, I, I was uh, confronted with this aspect as well. Um, I was signed up to be an ACM lecturer, in, uh, ACM national na national lecture uh, uh, program in, uh, for two or three weeks in the, in February of 1967, which meant that I that uh, that I, I I give a list of three talks. And each place that each ACM chapter or, or, or university that wants to to have a speaker, they that they coordinate so that I have a schedule. I go from city to city every day. You, you probably did the same thing about yeah. about then, and um, uh, <clears throat> and um, you uh, and and uh, uh, so um, uh, the. The, and Stanford and Berkeley were on this on this list as well as as well as quite a few schools in the East, um, and uh, so so that was three weeks in February where I would where I was giving talks about different different things about uh, about programming languages mostly. Um, so so uh, <clears throat> and when I'm when, when I'm at uh, Caltech I'm. Uh, I, I've got to be either preparing my class lectures or uh, typing my book and, and getting it done. Uh, the, I, I'm in the middle of typing volume four at, at the, I mean chapter four at this time, which is the second part of volume two. So I'm about, I'm, I don't know, about one third of the way into volume two. Um, okay, so, so that's why I don't have time to do research. In other words, if, there's, if, if I get a new idea, if, if I'm saying here's a problem that ought to be solved, uh, when am I when, when am I going to do it? You know, yeah. maybe on the airplane. You know, you know. Yeah. You know. Um, and as you know, when you when, when you're a lecturer, you every day goes the same way. You get up, up at your hotel and at, uh, you get you get on the plane. Somebody meets you at noon, and you go out to the faculty w for lunch, and then they they and the, and then they have a small talk. Uh, uh, they ask you the same questions. You know, what where are you going to be tomorrow, Don? You know, and and so on. And, and uh, there's a you know, you give your lecture in the afternoon, and there's a party in the evening, and then you go to your hotel, and the next morning, you go off to the next city. Uh, after three weeks of this, I was, <laughs> I, I was, uh, I, I, I got really uh, uh, not in, not very good. So I, I, I skipped out in one case. There was a, a snowstorm in in Atlanta, so I skipped my talk in Atlanta, and I stayed an extra day. <laughs> but anyway, this was a, I'm trying to give you a f a, the flavor of, 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 of this. But on this trip in February, also, uh, it, it turned out to be very fruitful, because one of my stops was in, um, in Cornell, where Peter Wegner was a visiting professor. And we went out for a hike that weekend uh, to talk about uh, uh, to talk about the, the the main topic in in, in uh, programming language in those days is how do you define the semantics of a programming language? What's a good way to uh, uh, to formalize the meaning of 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 the sentences in that language? The, uh, when someone writes uh, a, a, a string of symbols, uh, we want to say exactly what that's what that means and and do it in a way that uh, uh, that we can that that, that we can. Prove interesting results about and make sure that our, our that we've translated correctly and that, that and uh, um, the there were a lot of ideas floating in the air uh, at the time, and I had come up with and and I had been you know thinking of how I'm presenting in the art of computer programming and I said well uh, you know I, there were two basic ways to do this uh, one is. Um, uh, top down, where where you have the context uh, telling you what to do. So you so you start out and you say, oh, uh, this is supposed to be a a program. What does a program mean? And then a program 
tells the things inside the program wh what they're supposed to mean. The other is bottom up, where you where you just start with one symbol. This is a number one, and said, oh, this means one. Then you, then you have a plus sign, and, the, and 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 one plus two, and then you, you build up from the bottom and say that means three. And and so we had a bottom up version of of uh, semantics and a top down version of semantics. Uh, and and I said, well, of course. Uh, and, and, and also Peter, Peter Wagner says to me, Don, why don't you, you know, use both, uh, top, both top down and bottom up? Well, he have the, they have the, um, uh, the synthesized attributes from the bottom up and the, and the inherited attributes that come, that, that come, that come down from the environment. Um, uh, and I said, well, uh, this is obviously impossible. Uh, uh, you get into circular reasoning. You, you can't define something in terms of, uh, of, of itself. And so we were talking about this, and after 10 minutes, I realized I was shouting uh, to him because, in fact, not only because I was realizing that that he was absolutely right that you could do it, uh, that you could do it both ways, and and, and def define the things in a way that they would not interfere with each other. That certain aspects of a meaning could come from the from the top, and, s and other aspects from the bottom, and, and that this actually made a a beautiful. Uh, 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 combination. So, Don, we were speaking about uh, semantics of programming languages, and you were shouting at Peter well, Wagner. I'm, I'm shouting at Peter Wagner because uh, <clears throat> it, it it turns out that there's that there is a beautiful way to combine the top down and bottom up uh, approaches simultaneously when you're defining semantics. <clears throat> so this is happening at, at uh, on a weekend at, as as we're hiking at, at Cornell in a in a beautiful park <coughs> by frozen, by icicles. Uh, I, understand, I can remember the scene because this was kind of an aha moment, you know, that doesn't happen to you very often in your life. And uh, <coughs> I, they, people tell me now no one's allowed it in uh, that park in February because it's too, it's too risky that you're gonna slide and hurt yourself. But, but uh, <coughs> it, was the, the, it was when, when uh, <coughs> all of a sudden it, it, it occurred to me that this might be possible. But I don't have time to do research. Um, and I, I'm, I have to go on and give more lectures. Um, well, I find myself the next week at Stanford University uh, speaking to, uh, uh, to the students, to the graduate students. Uh, I, I mean, I gave one, one of my, my regular lecture, and then there was an hour saying, uh, you know, the students ask questions to the, to the visitor. And there was a, a student there named Susan Graham, uh, who, of course, has turned out to be a very distinguished professor at Berkeley and editor of Transactions on, on Programming Languages and Systems. Um, and uh, she, she asked me a question. Well, Don, how, how do you think would be a good way to define semantics of, of programming languages? <clears throat> and, uh, so here was a chance. So here I, uh, you know, I, in the back of my mind, uh, as uh, through that week, I had been tossing around uh, this idea that Peter and I had talked about the week before. And so I said, well, let's let's try let's try it uh, let's try to sketch out a simple language and try to define its semantics. And and on the blackboard, uh, in response to Susan's questions, we and you know, and then we would erase and and, and go and and uh, um, <coughs> try things, and some things wouldn't work, but. But for the next 15 or 20 minutes, um, uh, I, I tried to write down something that I had never written down before, but was sort of in the back of my mind, uh, how to define a very simple uh, algebraic language and, uh, and convert it into a, a, a very simple machine language, which we invented, uh, uh, I mean, on the spot, you know, it's, uh, to be an abstract but fairly simple computer, and then we would try to write out the formal semantics f for this, so that the me so that uh, I could write a a a, a, um, a small a few lines of in this f in this algebraic language, and then we could we could parse it and see exactly uh, what the semantics would be, which would be the machine language program, and. Uh, uh, that, um, uh, of course, th there must have been a lot of bugs in it. But this was the this was the way I had to do research at that time. Is to, you know, I had a chance to, while I'm in front of the the students uh, uh, to to think about the research problem that it was just beginning to gel. Um, and uh, who knows, uh, you know, how how bad it 
it was followed up. But but this was uh, 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 on the other hand, uh, uh, being a teacher, that's when you get your thoughts in order best. If you're if you're only talking to yourself, you don't you don't organize your thoughts so, so as with as much discipline. So it, it probably was also not a bad way to do research. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, <coughs> I didn't get a chance to think about it <coughs> when I when I got home to. Caltech because I'm t I'm typing up uh, art of computer programming when I'm at home and I'm I'm doing you know, I'm being an editor and I'm and I'm teaching my classes uh, the rest of the time at Caltech uh, but then I in April I happened to be in uh, giving a lecture in Grenoble and a Frenchman uh, Louis Bollier asked me something about uh, how, how one might define semantics in, in, in another sort of a bull session in, 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 uh, in, in, in Grenoble in France. And um, that was my second chance to think about, about this problem uh, when, I'm, when I was talking with him there. Um, so I, I was stealing time you know, I, I, uh, from, uh, from, from the other things. Now, um, that wasn't the only thing going on in 67. So I wasn't only only you know th thinking of what to do with my future life and editing journals so on. I'm also teaching a class at Caltech uh, for sophomores. It's an all-year class, um, uh, in sort of introduction to abstract mathematics. And during the, and and uh, I, while I was while I was looking at a problem, uh, we, we had a visitor at Caltech uh, named Tre Trevor. Trevor Ed, what's his last name? I don't, Evans. Trevor Evans, uh, who, who, uh, uh, he and I were discussing how to work from axioms, uh, and to prove theorems from axioms. So this is a basic thing in abstract mathematics. Somebody sets down an axiom like the associative law, and uh, and then it says that if you know a uh, parenthesis a b times c is equal to a times parenthesis b c. That's an axiom, and uh, I was looking at, uh, and, and um, I was looking at other axioms that were that that were sort of random, um, and uh, one of the things I asked my uh, my students uh, in in the in the class was, uh, I was trying to teach the sophomores how to do how to do mini research pr problems, and so I, I gave them. Axioms, which I called an, the axioms of a grope, and they were supposed to develop grope theory. They were supposed to grope for for theorems. Um, uh, of course, the, the the mathematical theory well developed is is a group, which which we I, I've been teaching them, you know, axioms of groups, and one of them is the associative law. Another axiom of a group is that the that uh, an element times its inverse is equal to the identity, and uh, and another axiom is that the identity times anything is this, you know, identity times x is x. So groups have axioms, and w we learned that in the class how to derive consequences of these axioms um, that weren't exactly obvious at the beginning. So I said, okay, let's make a group, and I, and I think the axiom for a group was something like x times the quantity. Y x was equal to y, uh, and so so I give them this axiom, and I say to the class, you know, what um, what can you derive? Gro what, what, can you find all groups that have five elements? Can you find all you know all all? Uh, can you prove any theorems about normal subgroups or whatever it is? To make make up a theory, and uh, and as a and as a class we. We, we came back in a week and saying what what theorems could you come up with and then people you know and, and we tried to imagine ourselves in the in, in the shoes of an inventor of a mathematical theory uh, st starting with, with with axioms well Trevor Evans was there and and uh, <coughs> he he showed me how to uh, how to define what we call the the, the free group which is the the set of all if, if you have no it, 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 it can be infinite, but you take all strings of letters, uh, all, 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 all formulas. Is it possible to tell whether whether one formula can be proved equal to the other formula uh, just by using this one axiom of the group, the x times y x equals y? 
um, and he, he and he showed uh, he showed me a, a, a very nice way to solve that problem because he had been working at, he'd been working on on word problems in in, in uh, what's called universal algebra um, <coughs> study of axiom systems so um, uh, while I'm looking at Trevor Evans' solution to this problem, so you see this problem arose in connection with my teaching of the class. So, so I, I look at Trevor Evans' solution to this problem. I realized that I could, I, I, I could um, uh, develop an, an actual method that would work with axioms in general without thinking that a machine could figure out. The, the machine could start out with the axioms of group theory, and and after a small amount of, of computation, it could come up with a set of 10 consequences of those axioms that would be enough to decide the word problem for, for, for free groups. And the machine was doing it. We didn't need a, th a mathematician there to prove, uh, to, to say, oh, now try com combining this formula and this formula. Uh, with the technique I learned from Trevor Evans, and, and then a, a you know, the little extra twist that I, that I put on it, um, I could, I, 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 I could set the machine going on axioms and it would automatically know which consequences of these things, which things to plug in uh, would be potentially fruitful. And, and, it, and, uh, and, and if, uh, if we were lucky, uh, like we were in the case of group theory axioms, uh, it would finally get to the end and say, now there's nothing more can be proved. I've got enough, I've got a complete set of reductions that will take that will take, uh, if, if you apply these reductions and, and not, none of them applies, you've got it. It, 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 relates, a li uh, I, it relates to AI uh, techniques of the uh, expert systems, I, 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 in a way. So, um, so uh, uh, this, this idea uh, uh, came to me as I'm teaching the bas basic math class, and, uh, and uh, I, uh, my, the students in this class were supposed to do a term paper in, in the third quarter everybody work on this and and uh, and uh, w one of the best students in the class Peter Bendix was uh, chose to do his term paper by implementing the algorithm that I had sketched on the blackboard uh, one in one of the lectures um, that time and uh, so we could do experiments during the spring spring of 67 um, uh, trying out a whole, whole bunch of different kind of axioms and seeing in which ones the machine would would uh, it would solve and w which ones it would keep spinning and generating more and more reductions that that uh, that seemed to go without li limit and then we figured out in some cases how we could simp how we could introduce new axioms that would that would br bring the whole thing back down again and, and and so we're doing a lot of experiments on that kind of thing but I don't have time to sit down at home and, and, and work out work out the theory for um, <coughs> um, but I knew it was it was uh, it had lots of possibilities, and so you know. So here I had attribute grammars coming up in in February, and and uh, and these reduction systems uh, uh, coming up in March, and I'm supposed to be grinding out volume two of art, art of computer programming. I sent the, the the text of volume one had gone to Addison Wesley the previous year, and the copy editor had had uh, sent me back uh, corrections and told me, you know, Don, you're, you, this isn't good writing. You've got to change this. And you know, he t teach me Addison Wesley House style. Um, and <clears throat> and uh, um, the, the page proofs started to come. So I, so I had gone through galley proofs, but now, the, now it was time to get page proofs for volume one. And, the, and uh, uh, volume one was published in January of of 1968, but the page proof started to be available in the spring also. Yeah, so you're, you're, it's layer upon layer upon layer, layer upon layer. Upon layer. Right. And so there's a conference at the, in April, there's a conference uh, in Norway on simulation languages. That was another of the things I've been working on at Burroughs. We, we had a, we had an, uh, a language called SOL, Simulation Oriented Language, which was, a, a, which was a, uh, an improvement of the State of the art in in, in in system simulation, in what they call disc discrete simulation languages, and uh, there was a, a, a an international conference uh, held <coughs> in Norway by the people who had invented the, uh, the, the Simula language, which mm -hmm. which wasn't very well known, but but uh, they they organized this conference, and and I and I, I went to 
I, I went to that by visiting uh, Paris and Grenoble on my way because uh, Maurice Niva and I had also become friends and he had, his thesis was on uh, theory of context-free grammars and nobody in France would read it. And so I, he found a guy in America who would, who would, who would appreciate his work and so he came out and we, uh, we spent uh, some time together in 66 uh, uh, get, getting to know each other and talking about context-free grammar research. So I, so I, you know, I, I visited him in Paris and then I went to Grenoble and, I, and then went to Norway for this conference on simulation languages where I presented a paper about SOL and learned about simula and uh, so and so on. Then, you know, we, the, it, our, our, uh, our, my parents and Jill's parents are taking care of our kids while we're in Europe uh, during this time in, in, um, in April. Uh, <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm scheduled in, in um, June to, to lecture at a summer school in Copenhagen, an international summer school, uh, and uh, I, I'm, giving, I'm giving lectures about how to, how to parse, uh, uh, what's called uh, top-down parsing, uh, the LL of K uh, uh, is the terminology that developed after, this, after these lectures. This was a, a topic that I did put in, by, in, in, in my draft of, of chapter 10. Uh, um, it was something that I hadn't, that I understood well enough that I didn't have to p publish it at the time. So I, so, I, so I gave it for the first time in these lectures uh, in June in Copenhagen. Um, and that was a, a one-week series of lectures uh, with, with, uh, with several lectures every day, uh, five days. Uh, t uh, to be given there, and, and uh, the, the the summer school met uh, met for two weeks, and I was supposed to speak in the second week of that summer school. Um, all right. So, uh, <clears throat> what happened then in in uh, May? Uh, I had a massive bleeding ulcer, and I was in the hospital, and uh, and I, uh, you know, my body gave out. I was just doing all this stuff, and I and I couldn't take it. So, so uh, I learned uh, about myself. I, I had a wonderful doctor uh, who who showed me his textbook about ulcers. Now, at that time, they didn't know that that ulcers were are related to this uh, this bacteria. Um, uh, you know, it was just uh, it was as far as they were concerned, it was just acid uh, the stress. Uh, yeah, the, yeah and, and people would would get you know operations to. So that the stomach wouldn't produce so much acid and things like that. Um, uh, but uh, but anyway, uh, he showed me his textbook, uh, and his textbook described the typical ulcer patient, you know, and what other people call the type A personality, you know, and it was, and it just described me, you know, to a T. You know, I, I, all of the things that were that were uh, there. I I was I was uh, an automaton. I mean. I've been all my life a pretty much a test-taking machine, and you know, and I, I did, I, I saw a goal, and I put myself to it, and I worked on it, and, and pushed it through, and I didn't say no to people when they said, "Don, can you do this for me?" and and um, uh, uh, and so so at this point, uh, uh, and I saw, I, I could I could all of a sudden get to understand that, that I had this problem that I should. That, that I shouldn't uh, try to do the impossible stuff. And the doctor, I mean, why I say he's so wonderful, because doctors usually would, you know, talk down to patients and they keep their secrets to themselves. But here he let me look at his textbook and he, you know, he said, and so that I could, I could know that he wasn't, he, he wasn't just telling me something to, to make me feel good, but he would, you know, that I, that I had, that, he, that, that I had uh, access to, to, to to anything that, that that I wanted to know about my my condition, and uh, so I I, uh, I wrote uh, a letter to my publisher, framed in black, saying, you know, I'm not going to be able to to uh, get the, the manuscript of Volume Two to you this year. I'm sorry. Um, I I, uh, I, uh, uh, I I'm not supposed to work for the next three weeks. <laughs> Um, and uh, you know, and, and, and in fact, you can tell exactly where this where this was. I was I was writing a part of volume two, and I was I was when the when the ulcer, uh, you know, sort of 
happened when when the started to burst or whatever. Uh, I was I was w I was working out the answer to a, a a problem about greatest common divisors that that goes in, in about in the middle of volume two, and. And, uh, and and it was it was a, a exercise where you, where the answer had a lot of cases to it, so it takes about a page and a half to explain the answer. Uh, but it was a problem that needed to be studied, and nobody had studied it before. And I and I was looking working at it, and all of a sudden, um, b bingo! But um, I, the reason you can find it is if you if you look in the index to volume two under brute force, it refers you to a page. Uh, an answer page, and I was w solving this problem by brute force, and I and I um, and and so you look at that page, you can see exactly what exercise I was working on, and then I put it away, and I didn't, you know, I had only solved half of the exercise <laughs> before I could work on it again uh, a, a, a few weeks later. Um, so I went into the hospital. I, it wasn't too too bad, but the blood subsided. And I took iron pills and got. Ready, and uh, I could still I could still go to Copenhagen to give my lectures in uh, in, in June. Um, however, the first week of, it was supposed to be lectures by Niklas Wirth, um, and the second week was supposed to be lectures by me. Uh, but but Klaus had just gone on a around the world tour with his wife and had come down with dysentery in India and was extremely ill and was and had to cancel his lectures. So I was supposed to go on in the first week instead. Now, I, I was, t I was, uh, but I, but I was stealing time so bad. I, I didn't, re I hadn't really prepared my lectures. I, I said, oh, I have a week. I'll go to Copenhagen, listen to Klaus, and I'll prepare my lectures. And I hadn't prepared. So I, so I, uh, so I'm talking about stuff that has never been written down before, uh, never been developed to the students. And I get to Copenhagen uh, with one day. To prepare for for this week of lectures. Uh, <coughs> well, one thing in Copenhagen, there's there's wonderful parks, uh, not uh, all over the city, and I sat down under a big tree in one of those parks on that first day, and I thought of enough things to say in my first two lectures. And on the second day, I gave the lectures, and I sat down under that tree, and I worked out the lectures for the next day. And uh, and these lectures became my paper, eventual paper called Top-Down Syntax Analysis. Um, uh, and um, uh, that was the story of the you know the first part of June. <coughs> second part of June, I'm going to a conference in Oxford, uh, um, one of the first conferences on discrete mathematics. And there I'm presenting my paper on um, the new method that I had discovered about uh, at, uh, about uh, what's now called the Knuth-Bendix algorithm, the, the uh, word problems in, in universal algebra. And um, I, I, after I finished my lectures at Copenhagen, I had time to, re to, to write the paper that I was giving at Oxford uh, the following week. Um, and uh, and so there at Oxford, I get I meet a lot of other people and get more stimulated about combinatorial research, which I can't can't do. Um, come back to Stanford. I mean, come back to Caltech, and and uh, you know I was, well, I'm working as a consultant as well. Or I, or I, or I resigned from ten editorial boards <laughs> uh, at this time. Uh, you know, no more ACM Journal, no more Communications. I I, I gave up all of the all of the editor ships that I was on and, uh, in order to cut down my workload. Um, uh, but um, the next time I had, and, and, I start, and I started working again on volume two uh, uh, to where I left off to, uh, at the time of the ulcer, but I would be careful to go to sleep and, get, and, and keep a regular, a regular schedule. Um, in, the fall, I'm, I, in the fall, I went to a conference in Santa Barbara um, and a, a, co a conference on combinatorial mathematics in Santa Barbara, and I—that uh, was my f the first chance to be away from Caltech, so away from my teaching duties, away from having to type out of computer programming, and so that's where I—I I had three days to sit on the beach and develop the theory of attribute grammars. This this idea of top-down and bottom-up. Um, uh, uh, and I, 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 uh, I cut out of the whole conference. I didn't go to any of the talks. I just sat on the beach and <laughs> worked out a theory of attribute grammars. It turned out I, 
I wasn't that interested in most of the talks, although I, I met I met people that became lifelong friends at the at the uh, at the um, meals, but, uh, and we talked about things uh, offline. But the the formal talks themselves, I was getting disappointed with mathematical talks. I was uh, uh, I. I found myself in most lectures on mathematics that I heard in 1966 and 67. I, I sat in the back row and I said, so what, so what? Uh, computer science was becoming much more exciting to me. And so, uh, and so when I finally made my, dis my career decision as to, as to where to go, uh, uh, I, had, I had four main choices. One was to stay at Caltech. They offered me a full professor in mathematics. I could go to Harvard as a full professor in applied science, which meant computer science. Uh, I mean, that was as close as you could get to computer science there. At Harvard, I would have my job would have been to build up a computer science department there. Harvard was, uh, in Floyd's ter term, he w it was an advanced backwater <laughs> at that point in time for computer science um, and Caltech as well. Uh, because the Caltech and Harvard are so good at physics and chemistry, biology, they're thinking of computers as yeah, being there to somebody else's. Because, yeah. because they can help physicists and chemists and biologists, yeah. but they didn't think of it as having problems of its own interest. Uh, um, and Stanford, where we had the best de the, the best group of computer scientists in the world uh, already there and knowing that computer science had a, a, a great future and also the best students in the world uh, there uh, to, to, to work with. Um, so it was already, the problem was already built up. I could come to Stanford and be one of the boys instead of, and do computer science instead of, uh, instead of argue for computer science uh, and, and try to do, do uh, uh, brain uh, uh, barnstorming, for, uh, and and Berkeley uh, uh, was the fourth place uh, where, where I also can, uh, uh, I you know I I I, I th admired Berkeley very much as a uh, probably the greatest all around institution for, for, for covering everything. Stanford would cover. Whatever everything Stanford covered, it covered well, but it didn't have a professor of Sanskrit, you know. And Berkeley has a professor of Sanskrit, that, that kind of thing. But I was worried about Berkeley because uh, uh, <coughs> Ronald Reagan was governor, and the the uh, the I, I couldn't, you know, the, uh, uh, Stanford was a private school, wouldn't sub subject to the whims of, of politicians. Uh, so much as uh, as a, a University of California, so so I and but and, and and then Stanford had this great other other thing where the faculty can live on campus, and so I knew that I could come to Stanford and I, I and for and um, uh, the rest of my life I would be able to bike to work. I wouldn't have to have to do any commuting. So and Forsyth was a wonderful person, and all the group, all the group at Stanford were were, were great, and the students were, were best. So, so uh, it was almost a no-brainer for why I finally came to Stanford. And I, um, my my uh, uh, my offer from Stanford came through in February of '68, um, uh, which was the end. Of, the other three had had already come in earlier. But I was waiting for Stanford to before I made my final decision and. And uh, in February of '68, I finally got the uh, uh, the offer from Stanford. Uh, it was a month after vol Volume One had been published, and George said, "Oh yes, the, everybody's all smiles now." Um, uh, but '67, you see, was everyone this was all smiles because they had gone out on a limb to offer you a full professorship, or because no, because they they, 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 they the, the committees were saying this guy's this guy is just 30 years old. Yeah, yeah, that's what um, I meant by going out. Of yeah, yeah, right. And and uh, you know, I, I was born in thirty. This is sixty-eight, and here, January sixty-eight. But then, but then, when they looked at the book, they said, "Oh, there's some credibility here." Yeah, um, yeah. Um, and and uh, so so that helped me. But so so, uh, I got through sixty-seven and learned how to slack off uh, <laughs> a little bit, right? And and uh, I've always felt after that that uh, and hearing many other 
stories of people when they when did they get the uh, these these special insights that that turn out to be important you know in their research thing and it was very rarely in a very in, in a settled time of their life where they were where where they had uh, a, a, a slight, you know comfortable living conditions and 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 a good um, you know, good uh, uh, I can't, the word is escaping me now but uh, uh, anyway luxury uh, uh, set up a nice office space and good lighting and so on no the the people are working in a garret they're 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 uh, they're starving they got kids screaming they're they, you know the war going on or something they, but they but that's when they get their a lot of the most almost every breakthrough ideas so I always wondered if you wanted to set up a think tank where you were going to get the most productivity out of your out of your scientists uh, you would have wouldn't you have to you know not exactly torture them but but uh, uh, deprive them of, of things it's it's not it's not sustainable um, still the, the, looking back that was a that was a time when uh, you know I uh, I uh, did as much science as I could uh, as well as trying to fill all my other obligations uh, Don to go back to the um, uh, Sanford uh, move the um, couple questions come up because I was around and I was yeah I remember sitting in George Forsyth's office just a handful of us people uh, considering uh, the appointment of this young guy from Caltech yeah. who had this wonderful outline of the of books and one of the things that we were discussing was um, uh, Don Knuth uh, wanted us to also hire Bob Floyd it yes. turns out that hiring Bob Floyd was a wonderful idea. Bob Floyd yeah. was magnificent, but uh, it hadn't occurred to us until you brought it up, mm -hmm. and then we did it. Can you go into yeah. that story? Yeah, that's yeah, because because Bob was uh, had, was was a very special uh, 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 very special person to me throughout this period. Uh, <coughs> I. Uh, as I said, I, I'd been reading the literature about programming languages uh, uh, avidly, and, and when I was asked to write a book about it in '62, you know, I, I knew that there were these people had written nice papers, but nobody uh, knew how to sort out the the the, the uh, weeds from the the tares from the wheat. So the um, uh, and and uh, at the in the early in the early days, like by 1964, uh, I would my my strong opinion was that five uh, good papers about programming languages had ever been written, and four of them were by Bob Floyd. Um, I I met Bob the first time in summer of '62 when when I had was working on this compiler for this Fortran compiler for, uh, for Univac, and <coughs> and uh, at the end of the summer went to the ACM conference in Syracuse, New York, and Bob was there. And uh, we, we hit it off uh, uh, very well from the right away. He was showing me his strange idea that you could prove a, pro a computer program correct. Uh, something I had nev never occurred to me. I mean, I, I, I said I, um, I, I was, uh, I was a, a I was a, a programmer in one room, and I was a mathematician in another room. Mathematicians prove things; programmers uh, write code, and they and they hope it works, and they twiddle it until it works. Uh, but Bob's saying, no, you don't have to twiddle. You can you can take a program, and you can say you can you can give a mathematical proof that 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 it, that it works. Uh, he was way ahead of me. There were very few people had ever conceived of of putting those two worlds together at the time. And he, he uh, McCarthy gave McCarthy was one of them. McCarthy, were, yeah. exactly right, right, right. John and, and, and Bob were the probably the. I don't know if there was anybody in Europe uh, had yet had done had 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 put you know had seen this right, and so so. Uh, uh, but Bob Bob tells me his his thoughts about this. You know when I meet him in 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 uh, in this conference in Syracuse. Uh, 
Um, and so then uh, I went to, to visit him uh, a year later in his, when I was in Massachusetts, uh, you know, at the crisis meeting with my publishers. He, he lived there, and so I went and spent a couple of days in Topsfield where he lived. And uh, then we, we shared ideas about sorting. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we had a, a, a really exciting correspondence o uh, over the next time where letters go back and forth, each one trying to trump the other about coming up with a, a better idea about, about something that's now called uh, uh, sorting networks. And Bob and I uh, developed a theory of sorting networks between us in a correspondence that uh, we, we were thinking at the time, you know, this looks like uh, Leibniz writing to Bernoulli, you know, in the old days, uh, the scientists uh, uh, trying to develop a new theory. We had a very exciting uh, time uh, working on these letters, and every time I would, I would send a letter off to Bob and thinking, uh, you know, thinking that, okay, now this is the last result in it, he would come back with a brand new idea and make me work harder again to come up with the, ne the next step in our, in our, uh, in, in our uh, development of this theory. So we weren't talking only about programming languages. We were talking also about you know, a variety of algorithms. We found we had, we, we, we had lots of, of common interests. He came out to visit me a couple times in California, and I, you know, and I, I visited him. So, uh, uh, so when I was making my uh, career decision, I said, hey, Bob, wouldn't it be nice if we could both end up at the same place? And I, I wrote him a letter, I, I, uh, probably the same letter where I was describing to him my idea about left to right parsing. I, I, as soon as I discovered it, I, I wrote immediately. To, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I wrote immediately to Bob uh, a twelve-page letter, the ideas of left to right parsing after I had come up with the idea, and and uh, then he, uh, you know comes back and says, oh, bravo, and did you think about this, and, all, and, and so, so we had this going on, and then uh, in, uh, in the, uh, at the beginning of 67, I, I said, you know, Bob, uh, why don't we think about trying to get into the same place together? What is your take on the, on the different places in the world? At that time, he was at Carnegie. Uh, he had left uh, Computer Associates in, uh, and, and, and spent, I think, two years at, at, at Carnegie. And and uh, he was enjoying it there, and he was teaching. He was you know introducing new things into the curriculum there, um, um, and uh, he 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 wrote me this letter assessing all of the all of the schools at the time the way he thought that their development of of computer science was, and that's when I quoted him a minute ago as saying Harvard was an advanced backwater. That comes out of that letter that he that he that he was uh, you know describing the way he way he looked at things and. And uh, at the end of the letter, he says, "You know, uh, uh, I think you're. you're I had already mentioned that I was that 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 Stanford was was my uh, my current uh, number one, uh, but I wasn't totally sure. And uh, and at the end, he he ended up concurring, and he said, if I would go there, and 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 he could go there, uh, the chances are he would go there too." Um, uh, and uh, pre I presented this to, uh, uh, to Forsyth, saying, "Why don't we try, try to make it a package deal?" And and uh, this meant uh, that they had to give up two professors to replace us with. They couldn't get a new t two new billets for uh, for us, and uh, um, <clears throat> so it was a lot of work on Stanford's part. But uh, but it did develop, and and uh, uh, we had uh, so except that you had to lose two, two other good, good people. Uh, uh, I think Bob and I did, did all right for the department. Um, and <clears throat> um, Maybe that was your first great service to our department, I recruiting Bob Floyd. Well, I don't know. I, I did have to work uh, a, a little bit. Uh, the year after I got here, I, I, to my surprise, uh, they had appointed him as an associate professor, but me as a full professor. and. Uh, uh, it was understandable because he didn't have a PhD. He had he had been a child prodigy, um, and had I, I think he had gotten into graduate school like at age 17 or something like this, and then dropped out to become a full-time pro uh, programmer. Um, and uh, so he didn't have the academic credentials, although he had all the best papers in the field. And the thing that finally 
so, so I had to meet with the provost and, and, and so on, saying, well, what, you know, this is, uh, it, it, it's time to promote him to full professor. And, and uh, the thing that, that clinched it was that he was the only person who had gotten, this is 1969, he was the only person that had been invited to give keynote addresses in two sessions of the International Congress of, uh, of, the, of the, you know, the, um, the, the, con the uh, Congress in Ljubljana in 71. In 71, okay, yeah. yeah. So, all right, so, so he, he uh, you know, so, uh, so that, that helped to. Uh, that was IFIPS. To, yeah, IFIPS, yeah. Uh, yeah, information processing. So, um, Don, maybe we can just say a little more about uh, Bob and his uh, life at Stanford. Right. Right, so I, uh, as, it, as it turned out, when, when, when we got together, uh, we, we we couldn't collaborate quite as well as when as when we were uh, writing letters, and this also I, I noticed this uh, uh, was, was true in other cases. It's like sometimes I I could advise my students better when I was on sabbatical than when we were having weekly meetings uh, because uh, because we, we you know some uh, it's not easy to work uh, uh, face to face uh, all the, all the time, but rather uh, sometimes. Uh, 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 offline instead of online. I told you my experience with Marshall Hall, that I couldn't think in his presence. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I have to confess that there are some women computer scientists that I, that uh, when I'm in their presence, I think only of their brown eyes and, uh, and uh, I have to, you know, I, 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 I love their research, but I, 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 my, I'm wired uh, in so certain ways that, that may get, uh, mean that uh, we, we, we should write our joint papers by, by male, uh, um, or by, by female, <laughs> anyway, anyway, no. Um, uh, so anyway, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, we, 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 we wrote, uh, we, we did a lot of, of, of joint work uh, in the early 70s, but, but, but also, uh, 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 it, it turned out that that when Bob became chair of the department, I, I'm not sure exactly when that was. Probably uh, right after I think my sabbatical. 1972. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, because I, I went on I, I, I went on leave of absence to, and, uh, uh, for a year in Norway, and and uh, then I, I I came back and Bob was chair of the department, and he and he took that job extremely seriously and and uh, uh, worked on it. Uh, uh, to, to such an extent that he couldn't do any research very, very much at all during those during those three or four years when he was chair it was it maybe I don't know how many years five years um, and uh, uh, Bob uh, I, I started in being chair in 76 76 so like okay so, so it was four years okay and and that, that included the uh, uh, very detailed planning all aspects of our new building um, so uh, so w when he when he came back, then he had two years of sabbatical. That's one w one credit that you get as being a. a, a so there was a there, there was a break in our in our in our in our joint collaboration, and and uh, afterwards he, he he never quite caught up uh, to the leading edge of the same research topics that I was in. So we would work on things uh, uh, occasionally, but not at, at all the way we had been have, have been previously. Um, uh, we did, you know, we, we we wrote a paper that we're quite pleased with at the end of the '80s. So, you know, but it, but it was not, uh, it was not the the kind of thing that we that we imagined originally that we'd always be, you know, so in, in each other's backyard. Um, in fact, I'm a very bad um, coworker. You can't count on me to do anything because I get, you know, I, 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 it takes me a while to finish stuff and I think of something else and then and, and so how can anybody rely on me as a as as being able to 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 go with their agenda, um, uh, I I uh, uh, um, so 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 Bob during the 70s came up with a lot of ideas that uh, that were like his his method for uh, half tone for, uh, for 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 making gray level pictures that that that, that is in, in all the printers of the of, of the world now. Um, and uh, things that, that was done completely independently. I didn't even know about it until until a couple of years after he had c come up with these with these invention. Um, uh, but uh, 
it, you know, I, I'm dedicating a book to, to, to Bob, uh, the, the, my, uh, um, my collected works are being published in, seven vo in eight volumes. Um, and the seventh volume is, is selected papers on design of algorithms. And that one is, um, is dedicated to Bob Floyd because a lot of the joint papers, joint work we, de we did uh, occurs in that volume. And, uh, and I, uh, uh, I, I, I uh, he's one of the few people in my life that really uh, uh, I, uh, I, I consider one of my teachers, you know, that, that are the, that among the gurus that, that inspired yeah. me on. So, uh, Don, let, um, I'm going to call that the, uh, the end of your first period at Stanford <laughs> and uh, yeah. wanted to move into um, some questions about uh, your, what I call your second Stanford period. And, mm -hmm. and this is a very different, I, I've, I've sort of delineated this as a very different time. This is um, a time, I saw you shifting gears and I couldn't believe what was happening. You became, in a solitary way, the world's greatest programmer. It was your engineering phase. This was tech and metaphonic. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you disappeared into just miles of code. And fantastic coding ideas mm -hmm. just pouring out, plus your engineering uh, I mean, we were in the new building, and you were running back and forth from your office to where this new printing machine was installed, and you'd be debugging it with your eyes and with your symbols and pulling your hair out of your head because it wasn't working right and all that. You were just, mm -hmm. it's what the Na National Academy of Engineering would call an engineer. Yeah. Uh, tell me about oh, that, yeah. that period well, of your life. Okay, well, it, it, it ties in with with several things in the, and there was a year that you didn't see me when I was up at McCarthy's lab. <coughs> well, uh, I heard all about it. Starting yeah. this, but yeah. but one of the first papers that I collaborated with Bob Floyd on in 1970 was uh, uh, called um, ha having to do with avoiding go-to statements. Um, there, there was a there was a think uh, you know, a revolutionary new way to write programs came along in the 70s called structured programming. And it was it was a different way than we were used than we were used to when we when we uh, you know when I had done all my compilers in the 60s, <clears throat> and and Bob and I uh, were you know a lot of our earliest conversations at Stanford were were saying well let's uh, let's get on the bandwagon for this let's understand structured programming do it right and and uh, so one of our first papers was to was to uh, uh, do what we thought was you know. A, a better approach to the to this ideas of structured programming than than some people have been taking. They some people had had well, misunderstood that uh, if you just get rid of go-to statements and, and you have a structured program and and uh, it's like saying zero population growth. You 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 have a numerical goal, but you don't have the 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 you don't change the structure. So people were figuring out a way to write programs that were just as messy as before, but without using the word go to in them. And we and we you know said no 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 here's what, what here's what the real issues are. And so Bob and I were working on this. And so this was going on, and we and we're teaching students how to program how to write program at Stanford. But we had never really written more than a textbook code ourselves in this in this style. So here we are. You know, being full professors, telling people what, how 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 to do it, having never done it ourselves, uh, except in 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 uh, uh, really uh, uh, sterile uh, cases without any real world constraints. So, uh, <clears throat> so I uh, probably was itching. I mean, thank you for calling me the world's greatest programmer. I mean, I, I was always calling myself that in my in my in my in my head. I mean, I lo I love programming, and so I love to think that I was that I was doing it um, as well as anybody. But the uh, but the fact is, uh, uh, you know, the the new the new way of programming was something that I didn't have time to. Uh, to put much much effort into, um, and the emphasis in my comment was on the solitary. The you solitary. were a single programmer doing all I, this. I, no team. Th th that's right. Yeah. No. I I was. Um, 
uh, as I said, I, 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 it's hard for me to to, for, to, to go into somebody else's, uh, uh, to have somebody else um, uh, doing the drumming. Uh, I had to march to my, I, I mean, I, I, I had the art of computer programming too, so I, I could never be, I, I, I could never uh, uh, be, a, be a, a reliable uh, part of a, of a team that I wasn't the, the, the head of, I guess. Um, um, but but uh, I, I did uh, uh, have, uh, I, I, I did f first have to get into that mode by, because I was forced to. Um, uh, I was chair of the uh, of a committee at Stanford of f for our um, uh, our Stanford uh, the university reports, and we, and uh, you know Stan we we put out lots and lots of reports from all phases of the department through these years, and uh, we had a big mailing list of and uh, and people were also uh, trading their reports with us, and and we had to keep uh, we had we had to have, have a massive bookkeeping system. Uh, uh, just to keep the correspondence and so that the secretaries in, in charge of it could know who had paid for their reports, who were we sharing with, and, and all, all, the, uh, all this uh, uh, administrative type of work had to be done. And it, was, it seemed like just a small matter of programming to do this. Um, I had a grad student who, who volunteered to do this as his master's project uh, to, to write a program that would take care of the, all of the administrative chores of the Stanford tech reports distribution and he, he turned in his term paper and I looked at it uh, su superficially and I gave him an A on it and he graduated with his master's degree uh, and, a, and a week later the secretary called me up and said Don we're having a little trouble with this program can you can you take a look at it for us and, and uh, it, the program was running up at the AI lab uh, which I hadn't visited very often I went up there and took a look at the program and and I and I got to page five of the program, and I said, hmm, this is interesting. I'll, let me make a copy of this page. I'm going to show it to my class. It's the first time I saw where you change, you change one symbol on the page, and you can make the program run 50 times faster. You know, he had misunderstood a sorting algorithm. So, and so, so this was, I thought this was great. So then I turned to the next page, and he has a searching algorithm on there for binary search. And I said, oh, he, he made a very interesting error here. Uh, make a copy of this page so I can show my class next time I teach it uh, uh, the, uh, the wrong way to do binary search. Well, then I got to page eight or nine, and I realized that the way he had written his program was hopelessly wrong. Uh, it had worked. It, 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 he had written a program that would only work on the test case, uh, on the on the test case that he had used in his in his report for the master's thesis that would. That was based on a, you know a database of size three or something like this, and and and, it, and, it, and if you increase the database to four, all the structures would would break down. I mean, he was it was based on, on uh, uh, it was the most weird thing I, I would never conceive of in my life. He would he he would assume that uh, that the whole database is keep was being maintained by the text editor, and the text editor would generate an index of uh, the, the way the, the the thing did. And anyway, it was it was a. It was the, it was a completely hopeless. There was no way to fix the program. I, I thought I, you know I was going to sp spend the weekend and get give it to the secretary on Monday and she could. Work. There was no way. So I so I had to spend a month writing a program uh, that summer. I think it was probably 76, 75, 76, uh, 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 to cover up for my terrible error of giving this guy an A and <laughs> without grading it, without seeing what that he had really. That that the, that the paper, the report that he had made it look like his program was working, and it would, but it only worked on that on that one case. It was really it was really pathetic, and so I said, okay, I'll use structured programming. I can I'll I'll, I'll write up I'll, I'll I'll do it right. I'll, I'll, I'll this is my chance to do structured programming. I'll get learning experience out of it, and I got a big good appreciation for writing uh, administrative type programming I used to think it was trivial it was nothing you know, there was there was a lot to it and took and after a month I had a structured program that would do Stanford reports and you know and could install that and get back to the rest of my my life meanwhile I'd been up at the AI lab and I met uh, the people up there got to know like Leland Smith uh, who uh, uh, who was the who was a great mu musician professor and Leland Smith told me about a problem that he had. He was typesetting music, uh, and he he says I've got these. I, I got a piece of music, and and it's got uh, 
uh, you know, I, it, it may, maybe has 50 bars of music. I have to decide when to when to turn the page. Um, and I know how many how many notes are in each bar of the music, and I know uh, uh, you know how much can fit on a page. And but I like to have the have have the breaks come out right. Can uh, uh, is there any you know is there any algorithms that that could could, could, could work for this? And he, he described the problem with me as you have a sequence of numbers of how many notes there are and try to find a, a way to break it into, in, in, into uh, uh, lines and, and, and pages in a decent way. And so I looked at the problem. I said, hey, Leland, this is, this is great. Uh, it's a nice uh, application of something we in computer science call the dynamic programming algorithm method. And, and uh, look, here's how dynamic programming can be used to solve this problem. And then I, I'm teaching uh, uh, Stanford's problem seminar the next the next fall, and uh, I gave that. Uh, it came up in, in, in class where I would show the students, look how this we had this music problem and we can solve it with dynamic program. Um, and uh, <clears throat> one of the students I I don't remember who it was, uh, raised his hand and said, you know you you could also use that to to text, to English, to, uh, to, uh, to printing books. You could, you could say, instead of n notes uh, 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 into bars, uh, you could also say uh, letters in, 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 and words into, into lines and, and make paragraphs, um, uh, choosing good line breaks that way. And I, and I said, hey, that's cool. You know, you're right. Um, OK, now, um, <clears throat> then comes in the mail the proof sheets for volume two, uh, the, second, the second edition of volume two, uh, um, which is now going out for, for, for its uh, you know, second, second uh, I mean, I, I had changed a lot of pages in volume two of Art of Computer Programming. And uh, so I got uh, page proofs for the new edition. Um, <clears throat> during the 70s, the printing technology changed drastically. It was hot, it was done with, printing was done with hot lead in the 60s. But they switched over to work, to using film in the '70s, um, and uh, the so the, my whole book had been completely retypeset with a different technology, and the new fonts looked terrible. The 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 subscripts were in a different style from the the, the large letters, for example, and and the and the uh, spacing was very bad. And, and uh, you uh, you can look at books printed in the early 70s and, and it turns out that if it wasn't a if it wasn't a, a simple it, 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 well almost everything looked looked atrocious in, in, in those days um, and uh, I couldn't stand to see my books uh, uh, so ugly I mean I spent all I spent all this time working on it and, I, and then I can't be proud of something that looks that looks uh, hopeless and I'm tearing out my hair I went to uh, to, to Boston again, to, 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 and they said, "Oh, well, we we know these people in Poland. They can maybe uh, they can they they can uh, uh, imitate the fonts that you that you had in the old hot lead days, um, and and uh, it's probably not legal, but uh, we can probably sneak it sneak it through uh, uh, without nobody, you know, the copyright problems of the fonts." Uh, they they'll they'll try to do the best they can and get and, and, and do better. So then they come back to me with uh, at the beginning of '77 with uh, with the new version done with these Polish fonts, which were supposed to solve the problem, and they are just hopelessly bad. Um, at the same time, the very same time as February of '77, um, I'm on the I, I'm on the uh, the Stanford's. Uh, a comprehensive exam committee, and we're deciding what is the reading list going to be for next year's next year's comp. And Pat Winston had just come out with a new book on artificial intelligence, that and and the and the proofs of it were were just being done at uh, at at AAA Corporation in Southern California, one of Ed Fredkin's company. Um, they had a a new way of typesetting using lasers, and 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 uh, all digital. All uh, all dots of ink instead of instead of instead of photographic uh, uh, images and lenses, they were using uh, bits. Al algorithms, bits, uh, to do it. And I looked at these uh, galley proofs of uh, of Winston's book, and they and I, I I knew it was just bits, 
but they look gorgeous. They look absolutely as good as anything I'd ever seen printed by any method. Um, and you see, by this time, I was working at the AI lab where we had the, the Xerox graphics printer, which, which, which did bits at, a, at about 120 dots per inch. And uh, it, it, it looked interesting, but it didn't look beautiful in any, by, by any stretch of the imagination. Here, uh, with, uh, I think this was uh, 1,000 dots per inch at triple I, uh, it was, you couldn't tell the difference. And it was like, you know, I, I come from Wisconsin, and I, in Wisconsin, we never eat margarine. Uh, uh, margin was illegal to, to bring into the state of Wisconsin unless uh, unless you didn't color it, um, and so I, you know I'm raised on butter, and, and it's the same thing here. And in, in, you yeah. know I, in, with uh, with typography, I'm thinking okay, uh, I, uh, digital typography would have to be like margarine. It, it couldn't be the real thing. But no, no, there's no our eyes uh, uh, don't see any difference uh, when the when the when when you got enough dots uh, to the inch. So. A week later, I'm, uh, I'm flying down with Les Ernest to, to Southern California to uh, to Triple I and finding out uh, what uh, uh, what's going on there. Uh, uh, how how can we get this uh, this machine and do it? And um, meanwhile, I had uh, also I had planned to have my sabbatical year 78, 77, 78. I was going to spend my sabbatical year in in, in Chile. Um, Don, can I interrupt you yeah. just a second and say that? Uh, uh, I don't know if Fredkin was still involved with Triple I at no. that time, but Triple yeah. I never gets enough credit for those those really revolutionary ideas. That's not right. just the not just those ideas, but yeah. the high speed graphics ideas. Oh yeah, and and, and uh, I, that's when I met Rich Chappelle down there, and he's working on uh, on character recognition problems and things that, that uh, I mean, that, yeah, it's uh, uh, and and they had been doing it actually for a long time. I mean, they uh, at on on microfilm. Uh, before doing Winston's book, uh, you know, they this was the second generation. Uh, uh, they were uh, w uh, first. They had been using the digital technology for for uh, uh, you know, at really high resolutions on on microfilm, uh, oh, and and so many other things going on. And Fredkin is a well, right at the beginning, yeah. Fredkin revolutionized film reading yeah. using the PDP one. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I interrupt yeah. you. You're on your no, way but, to Chile. No, but Ed is, a, Ed, Ed is a, his his life is ten times as interesting as mine. So, we, but I, I it, it's it, it, I, I'm sure that every time I hear more about Ed, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, as just another, uh, there's he's he's an incredible person. We got to get uh, um, you know twenty oral history. Well, setting. I think Ed may have may yeah. be a subject for yeah. one of these oral yeah. histories yeah. of a computer history museum. So. So anyway, uh, I, I, I canceled my, my, my uh, sabbatical plan for, for Chile. I wrote to them saying, I'm sorry, we, you know, uh, I, I, I just decided to change. To, instead of working on volume four during my sabbatical, I'm going to, um, I, I'm, I'm going to work on typography. Uh, I, I just can't, you know, I, 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 I've got to solve this problem of, of, of getting typesetting right, and, and it's only zeros and ones I can get those I can get those dots on the page, uh, and, and so I'm got, I've got to write this program, and and uh, um, I, uh, 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 so, so I, that's when I became an engineer. <laughs> you know? Well, how much of the uh, I'm going to let you go on with this. But I just wanted to ask a question in the middle here. Uh, just related to myself, actually. Yeah. Uh, how much of this motivation to do tech uh, related to your just wanting to get back to being a programmer? And this well, just too, you were, it, life was going on in too abstract a way, and you wanted to get back to being a programmer and learning what the problems were, uh, or the joy very, of programming. It's a it's a very interesting hypothesis because you know, because really the, I you could see that I that I had this. W w the way I approached this the CS reports problem the year before uh, was an indication of this that I that I did want to sink my teeth into something other than a toy problem, and, and it wasn't real large, but it wasn't real small either. Um, so it's true that that I that I probably had this had this craving, but I but I have a, had a stronger craving to finish volume four, um, and I I did I did sincerely believe that it was only going to take me a year. Well, do, maybe volume do. four wasn't quite ready. Maybe it was oh, this is true. Still cooking. No, no, no. Absolutely, this is. There is. I, I, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, in 1975 and 76, you can check it out. The 
look at the Journal of the ACM, look at the SIAM Journal of Computing, look at uh, uh, oh, um, well, there's also SIAM Review and there's math journals, combinatorial journals, um, communi com communication of the ACM for that matter. Uh, you'll find more than half of those articles are, are things that belong in volume four. Uh, there's the, the whole, c it was, people were discovering things right and left that, that, I, that I knew deserved to be done right in volume four. Now, volume four is about combinatorial algorithms. Combinatorial algorithms was, was such a, a small topic in 1962 when, when, I, when I made that chapter seven of my, of my outline um, that uh, Uyo Handala asked me when I was in Norway, he said, how did you ever think of putting in a chapter about combinatorial algorithms in 1962? And I said, well, the only reason was that was the part I thought was most fun. Um, I, I really enjoyed writing like this program for Bose that I did overnight, you know, it was a combinatorial program. I, so so I, I had to have this chapter just for fun, but there was not almost nothing known about it at the time. Well, people will talk about combinatorial algorithms. Um, nowadays, they, they usually use the word combinatorial in a negative way, pejorative sense, instead of the way I, th I, I look at it. They say, oh, the combinatorics is going to kill you. The combinatorial is, you know, means that it's exploding, you can't handle it. Uh, it's it's a huge problem. Uh, the way the way I look at it, at it is I mean, combinatorial means this is where you've got to use some art. You've got to be really skillful in order to, because uh, one good idea can save you six orders of magnitude, um, make your program run a million times faster. You know, so so net, so uh, people are coming up with these ideas all the time, and 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 so for me the combinatorial explosion was the explosion of research. The, the, yeah. the, not the problems exploding, but the ideas were exploding, and, and so there's that much more to cover. So it, it, it's true that I also, in the back of my mind, I'm scared stiff that I can't write volume four anymore. Um, and so maybe I'm waiting for it to, to, uh, to simmer down. I mean, somebody did say to me once, um, after I solved the problem of typesetting, maybe I would you know, start to look at binding or something, because I, you know, I had to have something else to, to you know, some other reason. I've certainly seen enough graduate student procrastinators in my life. Um, that, uh, so maybe, maybe I, was, uh, I was in denial. Um, uh, but, well, but anyway, you headed into this major engineering As project. far as I knew, that, though, it was going to take me a year, and I, and I was going to work, so I, and I was going to enjoy having a year of, uh, of, of, of solving this, of, of writing this, this kind of a program, yeah. And then I was, Go, and, and the program was going to be just for me and, and my secretary, Phyllis, um, my super secretary, Phyllis. Uh, and, she, and I was going to teach her how to do it. She loved to do technical typing. And, uh, and, uh, and I could write my books, and she could, put them, and she could, she could make them uh, at, at her uh, 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 you know, dotting the I's and crossing T's and spot, spit and polish that, that, she, that she did. On, on my math papers that she, when she always typed my math paper. 